That was a close one. You're right. You're right up. You're right, every. You're right, everybody. All right, good. Let's continue. Let's continue on. Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome to this. Welcome to this video of my where I share another idea of mine. This is a movie idea based off. It's gonna be based around one man. Based around the man. Before you, before you get any, um, before I tell you, I'm gonna show you. Michael Whitman is the most famous tank commander of the Third Reich. He was the most decorated German tank ace of the war. At Kursk, the greatest tank battle in history, he spearheads the attack. But he just accumulated kill after kill. In Normandy, Whitman single-handedly halts an Allied advance. One German tank was able to knock out so many British tanks in a matter of a few minutes. Whitman's final battle turns him into a Nazi legend. It was almost suicidal for the Germans to mount the British tanks in a matter of a few minutes. Whitman's final battle turns him into a Nazi legend. It was almost suicidal for the Germans to mount that attack. Even though it's been 60 years after Whitman's death, his legacy, his mystique maintains. Lacam German Military Cemetery, Normandy, France. 21,000 graves, a monument to the death of the German army in Normandy and to the downfall of Adolf Hitler's reviled Third Reich. And yet amongst the rows of unadorned gravestones, there is one man's grave that is always honored with fresh flowers. His name, Michael Whitman. Whitman is considered the greatest tank ace of all time. He was the ace of aces. Many people say that he was a very quiet, likable man. He wasn't a, your typical Nazi. Most tank commanders weren't personally decorated by Hitler, but most didn't quite stand out with the number of kills that, that Whitman did. Whitman's mentality was aggressive, motivated, disciplined, kind of a, encapsulates the panzer arm of World War II into a, a, a person. Whitman died here in the fields of Normandy. But his legend began in the fields of Bavaria. Born in 1914 on a farm south of Nuremberg, Whitman was a country boy living the healthy outdoor life. At 19, Whitman is drafted into the army for compulsory service. As all young men are in the Germany of Adolf Hitler. In 1937, after completing his service, Michael Whitman, age 23, eagerly volunteers for Hitler's personal bodyguard, the Leibstandard SS Adolf Hitler. It's an elite unit. They were in parades. They were very regimented. It would have been hand-picked personnel. Uh, they would have had certain height and physical fitness requirements, a uh, certain look. He's not only a volunteer, but he's seemingly politically indoctrinated to want to be part of this unit. I swear to thee, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Chancellor of the German Reich, loyalty and bravery. I vow to thee, 
obedience unto death. Being the honor guard, I'm sure it was very appealing to somebody in their early 20s. With the you know, black uniforms and the, the smart look and the, the whole elite quality about them. Michael Whitman embraces absolute loyalty to Adolf Hitler and his policy of persecution of the Jews. and to his program of conquest and expansion of the Third Reich. But in September 1939, Hitler invades Poland, triggering the Second World War. Now for Whitman and his generation of young Nazis, the parades are over and the fighting begins. Because of his excellence as a driver, Whitman is given command of a reconnaissance vehicle. By early summer 1941, the Nazis are the masters of Europe. But for Adolf Hitler, the real prize lies to the east, the Soviet Empire, vast spaces for the master race to conquer and colonize. June 22, 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union, codename Operation Barbarossa. Three million German soldiers, led by 3,600 tanks, plunge into the Soviet Union. Against the Germans, the Soviets mobilize. 2.9 million men and 20,000 tanks. Despite their superior numbers, the Soviets are quickly overwhelmed by the speed and skill of the German panzers. Michael Whitman's reconnaissance unit races over the Soviet frontier with a Leibstandard, part of the leading armored force. Hitler's armored divisions were important in the fact that they were the ones that were spearheading the... Are vegans healthy? Are vegetarians? Dang, dang ads. French fries and beer are vegan. The advances, the whole mentality of the tank force was always keep moving. Whitman and the Leibstandart are now part of the notorious Waffen-SS. The Waffen-SS had a few premier divisions, Leibstandart being one of them, that maintained its elite status throughout the war. As the Panzers slash hundreds of kilometers through Russian defenses, millions of prisoners are taken. The Waffen-SS does have a reputation for committing atrocities on the Eastern Front. Over three million will be shot or starved to death. Three weeks after the invasion, the Leibstandart is closing in on the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. At the forefront is reconnaissance sergeant Michael Whitman. July 12, 1941. The Panzers advance over hilly, wooded country. As they near the city of Zhitomir, 200 kilometers southwest of Kiev, the Soviets counterattack. Dozens of Soviet T-34 tanks bear down on the Leibstandard. The T-34 has been a shock for the Germans. Weighing 26 tons, the T-34 is heavily armored with sloping sides to deflect shells. Armed with a powerful 76.2 millimeter gun, it is better than anything the Germans can field. Whitman is ordered to reconnoiter the enemy forces in a Sturmgeschütz III or Stug. Whitman drove his Sturmgeschütz to high ground to try to locate the Soviets. He spotted two groups of Soviet T-34 tanks, six coming from northeast and another 12 from the east. That meant 18 T-34s against Whitman's single assault gun. It was no match. Whitman had to act quickly to even the odds. He ordered his driver to take the Sturmgeschütz off the high ground. Whitman has been ordered not to engage the enemy tanks, as the heavier T-34s outgun his Sturmgeschütz III. Sturmgeschütz is designed initially to be infantry support. 
It's not designed to engage other tanks. Built on the chassis of a Panzer III, the Stug is a turretless assault gun, which means the driver has to swing the whole vehicle around to aim its high-velocity 75-millimeter cannon. The Sturmgeschütz has a movable uh, cannon of 24 degrees only. You have to face the enemy straight forward, not from the side. If you see the enemy, you have to turn. Despite being outnumbered and outmatched by the Russian tanks, Whitman disobeys his orders and attacks the T-34s. This personality that was mated to the panzer credo of attack, that uh, that would have been the first thing he was looking for, was an opportunity to be preempted. As the T-34 surged forward towards the crest of the hill, Wittmann's only hope was to set up an ambush. It was a direct hit. A second T-34 surged over the hill. It went up in flames. A third T-34 managed to get a shot at Wittmann's Sturmgeschütz. The T-34s were not as accurate, we thought at least, than ours. More Russian tanks poured forward. There were just too many. Wittmann headed for cover. He used the assault gun's low profile to hide it in a small wood. I liked the Sturmgeschütz because uh, of the low silhouette. And that gave me a, 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 a feeling being safer. But facing so many T-34s, there was nowhere for him to hide. Wittmann's driver swiveled the Stug to bring its gun to bear on the Russian. Firing would have, would have definitely been an issue because of the inability to track a target via a turret. You would have to maneuver the vehicle. Again, his gunner scored a direct hit. With the T-34, the only weak part is uh, between uh, the, the turret and uh, the body to get right into the crack. Another T-34 tried to target the thin side armor on the Sturmgeschutz. Wittmann had to turn quickly and fire before the Russian got in a shot. You hit the tracks if you can. When the tracks uh, burst, of course, he just goes around in a circle. With his fast maneuvering, Wittmann began to even the odds. Then, three more enemy tanks attacked. Wittmann opened fire. Only one of the Soviet tanks escaped. I wonder what Stalin said Six about this of the formidable T-34s destroyed in just a few minutes. Whitman and his crew stopped the Soviet armored attack. For his actions, Whitman is awarded the Iron Cross second class. Wow. Impressed by his exploits, Whitman's commanders send him back to Germany to train to become an officer of the SS. Whitman's career is on the rise. Autumn 1942. Bad Tulse, Germany. Michael Whitman begins his training in Heinrich Himmler's Waffen SS school. Its aim is to form a new SS military elite, the future leaders of Hitler's Nazi Empire. Whitman graduates as an SS second lieutenant and is soon training on Germany's newest tank, the Tiger. Hitler's answer to the Soviet T-34, it is the most formidable tank in the world. At 100 millimeters, the Tiger's frontal armor is virtually impregnable. Its 88 millimeter gun can cut through a T-34 at over two kilometers. Wir waren und Tiger Leute waren stolz, hatten das beste Gerät, was wir hatten. Es war auch ein guter Panzer und wir waren zum ersten Mal den russischen Panzern Haus hoch überlegen. In February 19. 
Uh, I'm stopping right there to say this. A tank like, but a tank like that always has its weaknesses. No, no tanks imper, no tank is impenet impenetrable. There has to be a weakness in case it, in case the worst happened and they, and it gets stolen by the enemy and used against them, used against, used against its creators. If you know what I mean. Wir waren nun Tigerleute, waren stolz, hatten das beste Gerät, was wir hatten. Und zwar auch ein guter Panzer. Und wir waren zum ersten Mal den russischen Panzern haushoch überlegen. In February 1943, Whitman is called back to the Russian front as part of the Leibstandard's new Tiger Company. But by the summer, the tide of battle is turning against Germany. Soviet forces surge west, creating a huge bulge protruding into the German lines near the Russian city of Kursk. Desperate to regain the initiative, Adolf Hitler plans a counteroffensive, Operation Citadel. It will be a two-pronged attack from north and south to chop off the bulge, leaving half a million Soviet soldiers cut off and trapped. For the Citadel offensive, the Germans have amassed 780,000 men and 2,500 tanks. To meet the Germans, the Soviets field almost 2 million men and more than 5,000 tanks. The Leibstandart will be at the front of the southern attack. With them at the spearhead will be Michael Whitman, now commanding a platoon of five Tiger tanks. On the eve of battle, Whitman's commander reads out Adolf Hitler's message to the crews. Soldiers, today you set out on a great offensive whose result can decisively affect the outcome of the war. My soldiers, now, finally, you have better tanks than the enemy. The German homeland looks to you with ardent confidence. We just thought we were superior to the, to the Russian tanks. At least we were brainwashed to believe that, which helps to make you feel superior, you know. You know what propaganda does. <laughs> July 5th, 1943. At dawn, the Tiger crews wait for their attack to begin. The order came over the tank radios. Panzers, forward! advanced we were met by a relentless storm dang it star form the greatest game you've never heard of well to begin with it's basically civilization in space but with thousands and thousands of players and the absolute gargantuan size of the 3d map is staggering the sheer number of players vying for galactic dominance is incredible and they do this in a political landscape that's completely driven by themselves and it's the kind of people this sort of game attracts strategists who create elaborate plans of attack Politicians who debate and scheme, turtles who build vast industrial empires, and the instigators who just want to see the world burn. When you combine them all on Discord, you get a wonderful, helpful community that produces incredible stories of the rise and fall of empires. Many of the devs were hired from the community, and they hang out on Discord all the time. The community manager regularly makes a fool of himself with music videos, and the CEO has problems pronouncing the word strategy. 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 Okay. Strategy. <laughs> then there's the rich customization of your empire, with factions that define your overall playstyle and your choice of policies that reinforces it. And that each station is uniquely customized. It's all of these things. The magnitude, the community, the politics, the strategy, and the stories that are unavoidably created as players live out miniature timelines of human expansion. It's the journey each game becomes that makes Starborn the greatest game you've never heard of. Normally I don't normally I don't play ads with this, but I thought it sounded interesting, so let's continue. I'm a fire. The Russians had prepared line after line of defenses with dug-in T-34s. Because the T-34 was inferior to the Tiger I, it needed to compensate for its deficiencies. 
one of the ways was to have pre-dug positions for the vehicles. The incoming round would have to penetrate several feet of dirt to be able to actually get to the vehicle itself. The Tiger's powerful 88 millimeter gun is able to break through the Russian defenses. while the Russian shells bounce off the Tiger's armor. Overcoming line after line of Russian defense, Wittmann and the Tigers push towards the objective. But the Russians continue to throw wave after wave of tanks at our advance. These were all fresh targets for Wittmann's gunner. Wittmann's tank kept moving, firing as it turned, smashing one T-34 after another. Knocking out eight tanks and 12 anti-tank guns, this first day of battle has been a success for Wittmann and his elite crew. We call it to some gespiel, they are played together, you know, so that one interacts with the other the right way. The loader, the gunner, the commander, the driver, the radio man. It's a tightly knit group. July 12th, 1943. The Germans set off to assault the final Soviet defense line before Kursk. Whitman's commander is wounded, and Whitman must take over command of the Leibstandarts Tiger Company, just as the Battle of Kursk is about to reach its climax. Unknown to the Germans, the Russians are preparing a desperate last-ditch counterattack. The Germans were on the verge of breaking through into open country, and the Soviets were starting to panic. They were gonna throw whatever they had available into the mix. The Russians send 500 tanks west to attack the German right flank, but the Waffen-SS tanks turn east. These huge tank forces are about to collide near the little town of Prokhorovka. Second Lieutenant Whitman and his crew are ordered to high ground. In the distance, but seemed like a dust cloud was rising. Suddenly, hundreds of Soviet tanks appeared at the crest of a hill, headed straight towards Wittmann. We were in shock. The Soviets were not on the defensive, they were attacking. Just 1,600 meters from Wittmann, more than 100 Soviet tanks are charging towards him, over the gently rolling land of the steppe. We had a number of hills, but it was predominantly open terrain, so the Tiger tank could engage at long distance. With a well-aimed shot, a Tiger can knock out a T-34 at a distance of two kilometers. But the Russian tanks have to get much closer before their guns can have any effect on the Tigers. We have in angriff, we must see that so far, the pants and pants of the Rosy Kette, angriff on the Tigers. You have to imagine one big line of our tanks and on the other side were two T-34s. 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 The T-34s are racing towards us. Tracing us and trying to close the deadly gap. Russian tanks are coming towards us. Trying to close the deadly gap. They came back into view. Now only 800 meters away. The Tigers opened fire. A lot of tanks in a relatively small area. Something of a shooting gallery from a Tiger One commander's perspective. The T-34s were still not close enough to penetrate the armor of the Tigers. So they had to keep advancing straight through our barrage. They got to 700 meters. Getting closer. And closer. The Tiger guns were belching fire, but there were too many. They couldn't all be stopped. In this time, the Germans were already in the front. They were on the road. 
the Russians slam into the SS formation. At close range, the German tanks are vulnerable. Whitman's Tigers spring into action. Whitman's gunner fires on the move again and again. One of the reasons that Whitman was so successful as a Tiger commander was his ability to fire while moving on the with the vehicle. Not really could acquire the target, but they they get rounds on the target more quickly. Such a technique wasn't normal. In fact, German regulations stressed that the tanks should not fire when on the move. It's basically a waste of ammunition. But Whitman and his crew have mastered the difficult technique, using it to their advantage. From Whitman's perspective, Prokhorovka would have just been chaos. They would have had firing at close range. Whitman's tank is hit twice, but keeps on fighting. In the middle of both sides, Panzer on Panzer. The battle rages for hours. The Russians take appalling losses, but they succeed in slowing the German advance. Бомбила наша авиация, бомбила немецкая. Я думал, что они, наверное, даже цели не сказали. Бросали бомбы и все. Kursk is considered one of the greatest tank battles in history because of the numbers of tanks and other armored vehicles involved in a relatively small area. Is someone, is someone's gonna make it? Is someone ever makes a bad movie about the battle? Move, a movie based off the Battle of Curse. I hope they did, I hope they involved this this man we're talking about here. Our Tiger Company had a series of fine successes. Over the whole Citadel Curse battle, we destroyed 151 enemy tanks. Despite the success of the Tiger units, the ferocious Russian defenses has stopped Hitler's offensive. The Germans have lost the decisive tank battle on the Eastern Front. From now on, Michael Whitman will be fighting for his and for Nazi Germany's survival. In its third winter on the Eastern Front, the German army is in full retreat. The Russians have pushed them 500 kilometers from Kursk back into the Ukraine. Michael Whitman's Tiger unit is fighting a series of desperate rear guard actions. Tiger units would have been sent from one sector of the front to the other to try and plug gaps that had been opened up by Soviet armored forces and uh, attempted to uh, blunt them so that way German forces can continue their retreat to the west. The rapid Russian advance leaves the Soviet supply lines stretched dangerously thin, making supply convoys a vital necessity. December 6, 1943. Whitman and his unit, now designated the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion, are poised to attack a Soviet supply convoy near the town of Brusilov. But between the convoy and the Tigers are batteries of Russian anti-tank guns. The Soviet 76.2 millimeter divisional gun is a tank killer. It can smash through a Tiger's side armor at a distance of nearly 1,000 meters and wreck its tracks. To kill these anti-tank batteries, Whitman's tactic is to play a dangerous game, using himself and his tank as bait. 
Brickman drove to high ground. He was tempting the Russian gunners to fire at him. They took the bait, but now the gunners had revealed their positions. Under heavy fire, Whitman quickly retreated. Then our Tigers raced at the anti-tank guns from their blind spots, charging straight at them before the Russians could turn the guns around. Whitman's tactic has worked. The anti-tank batteries are now a smoking wreck. But his tiger reveals just how dangerous Whitman's game can be. We counted a total of 28 hits on the tiger. Some of them were smaller, of course, but there were also some big enough to easily put one's fist into. With the anti-tank batteries eliminated, Whitman races towards the supply road. He drives into cover to observe the road. And he spots a convoy. Though he's heavily outnumbered, Whitman decides to attack on his own. Whitman would have been trying to make the best of a bad situation. He would have been increasingly reckless due to necessity in engaging enemy targets. Like a wolf attacking its prey, he quickly knocks out the lead tank and the rear tank, leaving the convoy trapped on the road at his mercy. Wittmann blasted the enemy with furious barrages of gunfire. He placed his fiery mark on the road, smashing long lines of Soviet vehicles into junk. This caused mass confusion amongst the Soviets. Whitman's daring lone wolf attack has worked brilliantly. The Russian convoy has been destroyed. I wonder if Stalin ever put it... I wonder what Stalin thought of the... thought of this guy. And if he ever put a bounty... bounty on him. Bounty on him, if you know what I mean. Over the next few weeks, he goes on a rampage, knocking out 61 enemy tanks. His total kills soon reach 117. He paints the number of kills on his tank barrel. On January 16, 1944, Whitman is awarded the Knight's Cross, Nazi Germany's second highest military honor. And just a few weeks later, his Knight's Cross is upgraded with oak leaves and his second highest military honor. Then, just a few weeks later, his Knight's Cross is upgraded with oak leaves and he is promoted to first lieutenant. I wonder what his most famous kill on the Eastern Front was. If you, and by famous, I mean who was the most famous person that he kill, killed? most famous Soviet that he killed. If you know what I mean. On February 2nd, 1944, Whitman is called to the Fuhrer's Eastern Front headquarters to receive his new commendation from Adolf Hitler himself. I think one of the reasons that Whitman was decorated to the degree that he was, was that he was part of the Leibstandarte. SS Adolf Hitler division, and that's Hitler's name in the unit. Whitman is now ordered back to Germany, where his exploits have already made him famous. But the country he finds upon his return is in ruins, a result of Allied bombing. The sight of such senseless destruction of our cities is enough to make one's heart bleed. The Anglo-Americans have taught us to hate. 
they will see the site transformed into energy. We desire one thing, to get them in front of our guns. We have only one watchword, and that is revenge. The war effort was definitely going against Germany, and they were looking for ways to keep up the public morale. He visited the Henschel factory where the Tiger One was made and made a speech to the workers there. I think Whitman was used as propaganda for the Nazi party, but I don't think it was totally unwilling on his part. I think it was just another way of contributing to the war effort. The Reich made him a celebrity intentionally. During his triumphal tour of Germany, Whitman marries 19-year-old Hildegard Burmester. The couple is offered a special wedding gift, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, Hitler went to Whitman's wedding. Uh, a tank case in Germany was so important. Before he can arrange a honeymoon for his young bride, Whitman receives a new posting. So his wife accompanies him with his Tiger Battalion to the Chateau Elbeuf in Normandy, France. Michael Whitman will soon have his chance at revenge on Germany's enemies. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces land in Normandy. Hitler orders his panzer forces to drive the Allies back into the sea. For Michael Whitman and his Tigers, the Allied beachhead is over 200 kilometers away. Whitman started off on June 6 with 45 Tiger tanks, which is a full complement for that 101st Heavy SS tank battalion. But it takes Whitman five harrowing days to get his second company to the Normandy battlefield, under unrelenting attacks by Allied fighter bombers that decimate his forces. And a week later, it was down to about six vehicles that were serviceable. Whitman and the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion are positioned on the left and most crucial sector of the front, facing the British and the Canadians. The Germans would have concentrated their armored units around the British and Canadian sector because if that sector had fallen, that would have been the shortest route to Germany. So they had to hold that with their stronger units. The Allies are preparing the break out of the beachhead. Their plan is to send the British 7th Armored Division towards the key city of Caen, through the town of villers bocage June 13, 1944. Sheltering from Allied bombers, Whitman positions his surviving Tigers under the cover of trees near villers bocage The British 22nd Armored Brigade was moving through the town the column of British tanks is just 200 meters from Whitman's position. The British do not know Whitman is there, but they are about to find out. Then a man came into the command post and said, Obersturmführer, tanks are driving past. I don't think they are German. I had no idea that the enemy might suddenly appear. Whitman saw that there was an opportunity and that the British armored vehicles were in a nice, neat line approaching his position. I went outside and saw English and American tanks rolling past, about 150 to 200 meters distance. Never had I been so impressed by the strength of the enemy as I was by those tanks rolling by. Whitman is facing 138 tanks and armored vehicles, while he has only six tanks. The decision to attack was a very difficult one, but I knew it absolutely had to be, and I decided to strike out at the enemy. Whitman's split-second decision will become legendary. I had no time to assemble my company. I set off with one tank. I drove up to the column, surprised the English as much as they had surprised me. I 
first knocked out two tanks from the right of the column. Then one from the left. With them being in such close proximity to each other, there was no room to maneuver. I then turned about to the left and attacked the armored troop carriers in the middle of the armored regiment. They never left the road. They were so surprised that they took to flight, but not with their vehicles. Instead, they jumped out, and I shot up the battalion's vehicles as I drove by. I drove towards the rear of the column on the same road, knocking out every tank that came toward me. The enemy was thrown into total confusion. I was able to take out tanks as well as armored troop carriers. Then I drove straight into the town of villers bocage The town has already been occupied by British armor. Whitman continues his single-handed attack. claiming a total of 21 Allied tanks destroyed. I got to approximately the center of town, where I was hit by an anti-tank gun. My tank was disabled. I fired at and destroyed everything around me that I could reach. I then abandoned the tank. Whitman's deadly rampage has lasted barely 15 minutes, but he has devastated an entire enemy regiment. By single-handedly knocking out the British column, it kept the Allies from taking the area around Khan for two months, and it added to the mystique of Whitman's abilities as a panzer commander. German newsreels make the most of the Allied setback at villers bocage in den engen Straßen wurde eine stärkere amerikanische Panzereinheit gestellt und zusammengeschossen. Whitman is the most famous tank officer in the German Army. But the following day, the stress of battle shows on his face. Whitman is celebrated for his astounding feat by 1st SS Panzer Corps Commander Sepp Dietrich who recommends him for yet another commendation. In July, Whitman is once again personally decorated by Hitler, this time adding two swords to his knight's cross with oak leaves. But Whitman was the most decorated tank commander, uh, not only for his experience on the battlefield, but I would think also for the propaganda value that could be showcased through him. And so Michael Whitman reaches the height of his fame in Normandy. And it is in Normandy that his fate and his myth will be sealed. August 8th, 1944, two months after villers bocage Michael Whitman is now a captain and acting commander of his battalion. Yet as Whitman's career soars, Hitler's army in Normandy is headed towards destruction. Now the Allies launch a decisive punch, codenamed Operation Totalize. British and Canadian armor storms along the Cannes Falaise Road, smashing 14 kilometers through the German lines towards the village of Sento. 300 Allied tanks bear down on Sinto, the 12th SS Panzer Division is ordered to bar their advance. With the remnants of the heavily outnumbered division is Captain Michael Whitman, with a small group of Tiger tanks. The division's leader, Colonel Kurt Mayer, now orders an immediate counterattack. 
Whitman's tigers were standing ready behind the hedge east of Sinto. We had to risk the attack in order to win time. It was uh, almost suicidal for the Germans to mount that attack, but this was their system. If they were hit, they would hit back immediately. Whitman is in reserve, but he insists on leading the attack. Michael said to me, I must be in the attack myself, for the other officers can barely cope. Kurt Mayer knows the situation is hopeless. I shook Michael Whitman's hand. Michael left his youthful laugh and climbed into his tiger. And so Michael Whitman sets off on the attack. Just eight German tanks advancing against 300 Allied tanks. I don't think Whitman is exactly a fatalist. I don't think that he just figured that he was going to die. Maybe this was the best place to do it. Whitman and probably his crew didn't think so much about their own personal safety as the overall war effort. What Whitman doesn't know is there is a hidden danger waiting for him on either side of the Khan Falaise Road. British tanks of the Northamptonshire Yeomanry are lying in wait in the woods to his right. Canadian tanks of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers are hidden behind a wall to his left. We drove off Michael right of the road and I left of the road. Approximately 800 meters to Michael's right, there was a small wood, which looked suspicious. British tanks hidden in the woods observe Whitman. There were four, certainly four tigers, which came down on what would have been our side of the main road. The Canadians of the Sherbrookes were, as far as I can see, actually much nearer, but they were on the other side of the main road. The Canadian tanks are hidden from Whitman's view behind a long chateau wall. We sneaked up right beside a brick wall and got in reasonable cover. Just hit the wall just enough that you could get your gun, that you could move it sufficiently. I could see on the right the first German tanks came out from Sinso. Right away, I can remember the wireless net becoming active. I can see them, I can see them. I saw this dog is coming across in front of us, about 1,200 yards away. This, I can see them. I saw this dog is coming across in front of us, about 1,200 yards away. My tank commander, he said, we'll wait till they got to about 800 yards. We drove about one to one and a half kilometers. I was now starting to get a bit itchy. The Allies not only have the element of surprise, they have a new tank, the Sherman Firefly. The Firefly, upgunned with a powerful 17-pounder cannon, is able to penetrate 130 millimeters of steel, enough for even the thickest armor on a Tiger. For the first time, we realized that uh, we now had a tank which was equal to the Tiger. Whitman's Tigers are now in the kill zone. With my eyes, I could see the tank closest to the road, about two, 200 yards, I guess. The tank commander said, advanced driver, and we pulled out of cover. As we're pulling out of cover, he says, um, target the rear target. Or forward. We began taking heavy fire. And then I received a radio message from Michael. Achtung, Achtung, von rechts. I'd look around at the second tank. I fired one shot at the second tank. 
loader reloads, again fire when ready. Three of the four Tigers are now knocked out. Whitman's tank moves on alone. From close range, the Canadians now open fire at Whitman's tank. The one that he was in, uh, I think, went by me. Other people from my squad were firing at it now. Whitman's Tiger is hit. When I got to within 300 meters of Michael's Tiger, flames suddenly shot from the tank. I can remember a tremendous explosion and seeing the turret hit the ground. August 8th, 1944. Michael Whitman has fought his final battle. Whether his last thoughts as he went down the road were simply Valhalla, here I come, a sort of a death wish. He must have known there was no way they were going to win. August 25th, just days after Whitman's death, the German army in Normandy is defeated. Many of Hitler's soldiers remain in Normandy, buried in La Camme German military cemetery. Somber gravestones recall the unheralded end of the Nazi empire. Yet Michael Whitman is still celebrated. I, I think there's a myth to Michael Whitman's combat experiences. People look at him as, yes, being a Nazi, but it's not the reason that they admire his abilities in combat. I think if you're on the receiving end of that, you're going to have a different perspective. He uh, accepted the doctrines of uh, Hitler enough to get in his tank and, and invade other people's countries, country after country, to kill men, women and, ch and children. He might have been a hero to the Germans, but uh, not to me. Even though it's been 60 years after Whitman's death, his legacy, his mystique, maintains to today. I swear to thee, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Chancellor of the German Reich, obedience unto death. Guess Michael. So, did any of you guess Michael Whitman? That's the person. I, that's the person I'm trying to. That's the person of a mov, movie. That's the movie idea based around him and one or two other people, depending on. Depending on the situation, but definitely one person. The man, the man who killed Michael Whitman. Which we're gonna, which we're gonna find out right now. Right now. After this ad. Wait. Let's see that after this ad plays. So who killed Michael Whitman? We're gonna find out in this next video after this ad.
so that game almost was like a Call of Duty game. Hell let loose. Battle Car Carenta. Right now. This okay. is Filmora 9. The easy to use, drag and dropping, multi track, screen recording, social sharing video editor. Get the color just right on your makeup videos. Get a picture in picture for your gaming series. Customize over 100 titles for your tech reviews and export and share your videos to social media so fast your boss won't even notice. Hey, where's my report? Well, most of the time at least. Like and subscribe. Empower your imagination with Filmora 9. Breakthrough Entertainment presents. So, while watching this, I'm gonna have a little snack. In August 1944, a great tank battle was fought on these fields. One of the men killed in the action was Germany's highest scoring panzer race. Michael Whitman was known as the Black Baron. He had killed 138 tanks and he was a hero of the Third Reich. Like the death of the Red Baron in the First World War, there's been some controversy over who killed Michael Whitman. We have come back to this battlefield in Normandy to re-examine the evidence and determine who killed Michael Whitman. This is where the remains of Michael Whitman were found in 1983. And of course, a lot of groups have claimed that they killed Michael Whitman. The British claim that they have done it. Quite frankly, I'm quite pleased that I got rid of him. There's rumors that a Typhoon aircraft came in and killed him. It was found with the turret blown off. Only a Typhoon could have done that. And there's some that say the Canadians got him. I believe the Sherbrooks did knock out Michael Whitman. To resolve the mystery of who killed Michael Whitman, we're going to have to look at the battlefield and analyze it. We're going to have to look at the armor of both sides, and we're going to look at the men who fought in the battles in Normandy. This is the men of the Sherbrooks, the Northamptonshire Yeomanry, and of course the German Panzer Corps. And the most famous is Michael Whitman, Germany's top panzer race. Michael Whitman is born in 1914 and grows up a farm boy with ambition of greater things. At 19, he joins the military and quickly makes his way up through the ranks. By the war's outbreak in 1939, he is serving in the Fuhrer's own elite guard, the Liebstandard Adolf Hitler of the Waffen SS. Commanding a self-propelled gun, he quickly distinguishes himself on the battlefield, earning a reputation as a fearless leader. But this is only the beginning from Michael Whitman. In the spring of 1943, he is given command of one of Germany's most fearsome weapons, the Tiger Tank. Assigned to the Eastern Front, Whitman's bold tactics claim an impressive 56 tanks and artillery pieces in just over six months. By the end of January 1944, his overall tally soars to an amazing 100 kills. His exploits become headline news throughout Germany, dubbed the Black Baron by both friend and foe. In February, Whitman is decorated by Hitler himself. But for all the accolades, his greatest victory still lies ahead. 
battling the Allied invasion force on the Western Front. June 6, 1944, the Allies launch their invasion of Normandy. The German High Command quickly orders four divisions forward to reinforce the Normandy Front, including the 2nd Company, the 101st SS Panzer Battalion, now commanded by Michael Whitman. On June 13th, as a column of British armor rolls in to occupy the village of Villa Bocage, the Black Baron pulls up just outside town. I'm with Daniel Taylor, who's an expert on the Battle of Villers Bocage, and he's going to explain what happened on June 13th, 1944. So what was happening here with Whitman's Tigers? Well, they'd found themselves in this little lane. Um, they'd been advancing from Belgium uh, for about five or six days. The unit was strung out across hundreds of miles. They'd managed to get to here with five tanks. The place presents pretty good cover. So they're encamped along this lane? Yeah, dispersed along it, yes. So what happens in the morning? Well, uh, in the morning, uh, Whitman's roused by the, uh, the sound of tanks coming along the road. So they're literally, what, 200 yards away? About that. He'd have seen as the turrets went along that line. Right up on top of here? Up there, yes. OK, so now Whitman, what's his reaction to this? Well, he's, he's got very few options left open to him. There's probably an argument about what he should have done, but what he decided to do was attack. Ich hatte keine Zeit, meine Kompanie aufzustellen. Ich musste schnell handeln. Ich fuhr los mit nur einem Panzer bis zur Säule und überraschte die Engländer genauso viel, wie sie mich überrascht hatten. Ich musste schnell handeln. Ich fuhr los mit nur einem Panzer bis zur Säule und überraschte die Engländer genauso viel, wie sie mich überrascht hatten. Whitman's come barreling across the field. First shot takes out a firefly. He's hit them from what 50 yards? If that, yes. Point blank range. Oh, he's not going to miss. The rest of his unit is trying to engage a squadron up on the top of the hill you can see there. And he's come across the field and he runs into a column of transport. They all start bursting into flame. So now he's going to drive into town and he's leaving dead and burnt out vehicles behind him. So the guys in the village, do they know what's going to hit them? Absolutely not, no. It's, it, it's going to be a big, rude surprise to them any second now. So Vitton's come down, he's run into these four Cromwell tanks, which you think might have a bit of a chance against him. He, he managed to get a couple of shots off at the Tiger before he's, he's taken out. They just bounce off. So they're bouncing off at, what, 50 yards? 50 yards, yards, no distance at all. The following Cromwell has pulled behind uh, this wall and pulled into the courtyard of that building. Right. That's commanded by a Captain Dias. I suddenly saw this tiger tank shooting down the main street. I got the driver to reverse our tank into a farmyard. And in the next moment, to my astonishment, with no gunner in our gunner seat, the tiger went right in front of me. Unfortunately for the Cromwell, the gunners just got out to have a pee. And so there's no way that he can fire. With the so he's missed the glorious chance. Glorious chance. The Tiger's passing side on right in front of him. No way of firing. The Tiger then passes on, turns into the high street. Another target rich environment. Whitman's rampage claims a total of 12 tanks and 15 other vehicles, all in a little under 10 minutes. Deciding not to push his luck any further, he retreats back through the village. Good call. So how many tanks and uh, soft skin vehicles did he get credited for this attack? Well, the Germans credited him with, with an entire regiment. In this in this style, the tanks collided. In den engen Straßen wurde eine stärkere amerikanische Panzereinheit gestellt und zusammengeschossen. Seit dem ersten Tag der Invasion haben die Angloamerikaner rund 1000 schwere und schwerste Panzer verloren. Whitman's attack on the British is a huge gamble that pays off. 
With it, he single-handedly breaks the Allies' momentum and stalls their advance out of Normandy. For his actions of Villers Bocage, the Black Baron is once again decorated by Adolf Hitler. The ambitious farm boy has now become a living legend. But Whitman's luck is running out. In less than two months, the Third Reich's mighty Black Baron will be dead. Leaving behind an enduring mystery surrounding his death. Hey everybody, I know this has been a, a challenging and trying times for all of us here in the state of California, for that matter, all across this country. Pretty much every day someone asks, well, what can I do to meet this moment? Well, one thing you can do to meet this moment is to take a few moments of your time and fill out a form, the census form, nine easy questions to maintain our status, to maintain our voice, our representation as a state as it relates to making sure we draw down our fair share of funds from Congress, to make sure we're getting funding for schools, for parks, for playgrounds, roads, and bridges. Please take the time, answer those nine easy questions, take a moment, fill out that census form. And you can go to my2020census.gov. Make it happen today. Take the census now, everyone counts. June 13, 1944, Panzer Commander Michael Whitman makes military history with a daring solo attack on a British armored column at the Norman village of Villers Bocage. His actions that day stall the Allied advance on the strategic town of Caen, and it takes nearly two more months of bloody combat in the surrounding area to finally drive the Germans out. We're on the road south of Kong, going to the village of Sintho, the place of Michael Whitman's final battle. Throughout July 1944, the Allies launched a number of offensives at Kong, finally capturing it and pushing into the fields to the south, with some of the most severe fighting of the Normandy campaign. Throughout July, the Allies advanced a very short distance with tremendous casualties. No one suffered worse than the tankers, and in one month of battle, more than 400 Allied tanks were destroyed. One of the first things we saw in Normandy was a knocked out Sherman tank. And it had gone up in flames, as Shermans were infamous for exploding, going into a sheet of flame. 20 or 30 feet high. The tank that we saw still had two or three of the crew sitting inside, but no longer recognizable as human beings. The Germans used to call us Tommy Cookers because they burnt so easily. I became a fatalist overnight. And I'm glad I did because I think that's the only way you could survive. And one at that point realized that we were in tremendous danger because this was something that Germans could obviously do with their great guns. But go in one side and out, out, out the other sort of thing of some of our tanks. But the main thing was that they could knock out our tanks at a safe distance. And we had not been informed in any way but this is the fate that waited us just up the road. In your mind, every German tank was a tiger, because the tiger was a terror. And if it was a tiger, then you had to uh, fight for your life. Each one of us, you know, you had the jitters. Every time you saw the barges, because the gun was so much superior. Technically, the range needed to knock out a Tiger by a 75 was about two or three inches. The 
shots from 75 were bouncing off like ping pong balls. One thing we had in advantage was what we called a firefly. It was still the normal Sherman, but the 75 millimeter gun, uh, which was about six pounder, had been replaced by a 17 pounder. For the first time, we realized we now had a tank which was equal to the Tiger, and we were able to believe it. August 7th, 1944, more than 25,000 British and Canadian troops assemble for Operation Totalize, a major offensive devised to crack the German defensive line south of Caen. Unlike previous operations, Totalize is planned as a night assault to confuse the Germans and limit their response. It begins at midnight August 8th. The initial attack is a success, and in less than four hours, the Allies break through the German lines and begin advancing south. Progress in the dark is slow for some units, while others like the Northamptonshire Yeomanry and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers proceed quickly to their objectives. Isolated from the main force, they dig in for the inevitable German counterattack. And so it is, in the early hours of August 8th, the stage is set for the Allies' final confrontation with the Black Baron. The Northamptonshire Yeomanry were one of two units involved in the killing of Michael Whitman. And to recreate what happened to Whitman, we have to find out exactly where they were. Now we know that in 1944, they hid in the orchard south of St. Aniel. But in 60 years, a lot of things have changed. For example, the orchards aren't there anymore, so we're gonna have to try to determine where they were. And this is also true of the Sherbrooke's position, and it's gonna be a little challenging to try to find out exactly where everybody was. country road south of St. Agnan and by 8 a.m. the Yeomanry were on their objective which was the village. They discharged their infantry. They moved south into these woods and they built defensive positions in case there was a German counterattack. Today there's uh, no orchards and very little woods but this whole area was wooded in 1944 and from here they got a commanding view of the area to the south and to the west. You can see the route national over here and the Germans were further south. But as the Yeomanry were digging in, the Canadians were also advancing west of the Route Nationale. So what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, go by the Canadian Cemetery, and just a little bit north of it is Gumiznell, which is a very, very small hamlet. And this is where, where the Sherbrooke set up Note was in a stone wall around an, an old chateau. Here's looks like our wall. So this is our first entrance into Gumi's Mill. So we'll go right into the middle of the hamlet and we'll ask where this chateau was. So this is the eastern outskirts of the hamlet of Gomez Nell, and we're right on the Route Nationale. You can see the cars coming by. They're ruining our battlefield. So what I'm looking for is an old wall that belonged to an old chateau. And there's a lot of old stuff around here. What I'm on, monsieur. Was there monsieur? Yeah, well. Yeah. I'm looking for the location of the old chateau and the old wall. Il a vu mur. Oui, voilà. Tout de suite, on est ici. Et uh, tu cherches pour le, le place pour le vieux château. Et la vieux mur. Oui, voilà. Tout de suite, on est ici. Here. Oui, là, la there, maison. The house. 
et le vieux the château, château is here. ici. Okay. Et un mur wall, tout autour, all around. comme ça. Le château, the château was burned down by the il British. a brûlé Sorry? avec les Anglais. Mais ce n'était pas l'aviation, ni, le, nor, nor ni la, les chars, ni le... Euh, so what's happened is the uh, old chateau was just north of here and that the wall came around it was a huge wall that went up to this area around about 30 meters down that way then down to the, the main road then at the end of the war the chateau burnt down. Apparently, a bunch of English soldiers got drunk and uh, they, the thing caught fire. So this is the correct wall. I want to see if I can get inside there to see exactly what the Sherbrooks could see on the day of the battle. I'm going to cut through here. So that certainly looks like the wall we're looking for. If you look over here, you can actually see the work of the Sherbrooks. You can see the holes over there. Those are Sherman size holes. And that's where they would have broken through. You can also see where they knocked down the wall, the firing height. And of course, this is where they set up some of their defensive positions. It gave them an incredible field of fire. And if the Germans wanted to attack from Syntho north, the Sherbrooks had them. So based on the description, the Sherbrooks were hiding behind here. But what's really exceptional about this is that they were so well hidden that no one even knew they were here. And even the histories of the war afterwards don't mention anything about the Sherbrooks being here. Walters had picked such a superb position that no one was ever going to find him. But what he didn't know was that about a mile away to the south at the village of Syntho, the SS are having their little conference, their ops group, and they're planning a counterattack. And one of the men that's going to be in the counterattack is Michael Whitman. For the Germans, the situation is critical. Operation Totalize has broken their defensive line, decimating an entire division in the process. Now it threatens to cut off all remaining German units in Normandy. They have no choice but to strike back without delay to halt the Allied advance. Kurt Meyer, commanding the 12th SS Division, is ordered to launch a counterattack near the Route Nationale. Faced with overwhelming odds, Meyer calls upon the one man capable of turning the tide, the Black Baron. Here we go again with an ad. Hi, I'm Brad Callen, and in this video, I'm going to show you how anyone can quickly and easily create doodle videos, just like the one you're watching right now, using Doodly, our drag and drop doodle software that allows anyone, regardless of tech skills, to create highly engaging professional doodle videos in a matter of minutes. Because doodle videos are fun and engaging, they can get you more clicks, likes, shares, and most importantly, sales than any other type of video. Sorry. Four minutes. So get do you can check out Doodly at www.doodly.com. Sounds like an interesting video, but I'm not gonna play the whole five minute video, so we're just gonna skip it. Which is why Doodly is now the video tool of choice for over 150,000 businesses all over the world in virtually every industry and profession that you can imagine. Doodle videos are end of the village of Syntho and on August 8, 1944, it was where the Germans made their plans to do something about the breakthrough of total ice. So right in this area, Kurt Meyer 
met with Michael Whitman and other officers to discuss what measures were going to be taken for the counterattack. Their main concern was a series of Canadian tanks back over the ridge. He saw them massing. He knew they were going to have a large offensive coming very quickly. So he ordered Whitman to take his Tigers as well as some other tanks and some SP guns to come and hit the Canadians. Sort of like what he did at Villers Bocage. Get out there quick and try to put them in disarray and buy some time for the Germans. So at 11.30, he shook hands with Meyer and he went to his Tigers. At 12.30, they had launched their attack. for five tanks to come across this field and two to go on the other side of the Route Nationale. Their objective was to get over the hill and hit the Canadian tanks that were massing there for the second phase of Operation Totalize. It takes them about 10 minutes to get into this area and bang, the first Tiger gets hit. In the meantime, Whitman is over by the Route Nationale. He must have seen this because his radio communication goes. Achtung! Attention! Achtung. Attention! Back from the right. Attack from the right! Back Attack from the right! From the, right. the second tank goes up. It's brewed completely up in the air. And the third tank is disabled because they've hit the wheels of the track and it's trying to get out and it's retreating. In fact, it goes backwards across this field and bang, it goes up. So in a few minutes, the field is all burning wreckage. The men are climbing out of the turrets. They're bringing their wounded. They're trying to get out of here before they're shot down. And as they go by, they see Tiger number 007 and it's not moving and its turret is askew to the east. In the aftermath, no one is sure exactly what has become of the Black Baron. He simply declared missing in action. At the time, the only clues to his fate are a few scattered reports from surviving German tankers. When I looked out to the left, I saw that Michael's tank wasn't moving. The turret was displaced to the right and tilted down to the front somewhat. When I got to within about 250 to 300 meters, the flames suddenly shoot from the tank turret fly off and fall to the ground. These accounts would remain unsubstantiated for decades, until a photo of the battlefield taken by a French farmer in 1945 confirmed at least some of the details surrounding the destruction of Tiger 007. Within about 250 to 300 meters, as the flames suddenly shoot from the tank, the turret fly off and fall to the ground. These accounts would remain unsubstantiated for decades, until a photo of the battlefield taken by a French farmer in 1945 confirmed at least some of the details surrounding the destruction of Tiger 007. Since then, more and more evidence has been surfacing in the field near Gosmenil. Okay. C'est votre collection Voilà, c'est ma collection. C'est une pièce euh, oui. par le champ de bataille. Beaucoup de choses sont ramassées par mon père, oui. Surfacing in the field near Gosmenil. Oui. C'est votre this collection This is your collection voilà, Yes, this is the, the collection. Uh, Pieces from the battle field. Oui. Beaucoup de choses sont ramassées par mon père. Oui. My father, yes. Now, who, who drew now you found all these pieces, pieces uh, you and your father. Able to pair. Oui. Where? Uh, to the pair. Oui. Where? Quelle place? Dans le champ. Oui. Where, Where the corps. bodies were found. Et, et, et and all around region. also for the other oh, pieces. Oh, aussi, aussi, mais... Yes, but this one I can say oh, for sure came from 007. Sur le champ it's not in the best shape, but... So this is uh, remarkable to actually touch the pieces of our investigation. This is the real thing. Uh, you Radio phone? For the, for the throat? Yes, it needs a microphone. <laughs> so this is the... Uh, they would talk through a 
this part. So they talk to their throat and it would go out. It's quite unique to the Germans. It's likely that it came from Whitman's Tiger. This piece. Oh, wait, that's from Whitman's Tiger. Wow. This is uh, an 88 armored piercing shell. This is where the charge is. They load it in the gun. Go. Wait, wait, wait. The that, blast. That, that, that. That's why the tiger was deadly. This piece is also the one that was on the... It's the point of the... That's why the tiger was deadly. This piece is the door that was on the end of the turret. It's the floor of the turret. It's the floor. It's the part of the floor. Whitman. Oui. Oui. For the, for the and for the last time too. The last time, yes. So, that's why he cried when he, when he saw this piece. Oui, c'est ça. For the point of the foot. What's this? Right here. It fills in the missing part of the circle. Oui, like down the big explosion. Like oui. this. What is this? It's something I found the same day as the two circles from the turret. This is a rocket fired from a typhoon that was found at a similar time as they they dug up these pieces from the tiger. This uh, gives us another dimension of uh, who could possibly have killed Michael Whitman. These relics from Tiger 007 provide the first pieces of tangible evidence, linking battlefield accounts with a photo of Whitman's wrecked tank in the field near Gosmania. But they still have yet to reveal what became of the Black Baron himself, and more importantly, who it was that fired the fatal shot. To find answers, Norm Christie must reconstruct the battlefield, first by pinpointing the precise location where Whitman's tank was destroyed. So we're on the battlefield of August 8, 1944, right beside the Route Nationale. Michel, uh, qu'est-ce que vous trouvez en uh, 83? Right. Reconstruct the battlefield, first by pinpointing the precise location where Whitman's tank was destroyed. So we're on the battlefield of August 8, 1944, right beside the Route Nationale. Michel, uh, what did you find here in 83? Much further, 60 to 70 meters. Around 60 meters, perhaps. Certainly, on the place where the five men were. They had the SS insignia. Yes, on Whitman, he still had his uniform. The vest, encore. Okay. En cuir. So what Michel has told us is that they found a few remains just below the surface here. They, uh, first some on top, of, uh, a few fragments of bones, and then they called the German war graves in, and they started to dig, and they dug down and found more remains. They found Panzer tanker uniforms, uh, identity discs, a pistol that belonged to Michael Whitman found here. So they came to the conclusion that the remains found here were the collective remains of Tiger 007, which was Whitman's tank for the attack on August 8th. So now we know out of the four tigers that were destroyed on this field, that the one here belonged to Michael Whitman. But the question remains as to who fired the fatal shot. Having established the positions of the Allied units, Norm will attempt to resolve whether it was the Yeomanry or the Sherbrooks that killed the Black Baron. Here we have the positions of the Sherbrooks. We know that they were located just behind the chateau. And of course, we know what the Yeomanry were over there at St. Etienne. So we have that position and this position, which was the, the pinchers that caught the tiger attack. So now, using some aerial photographs taken in 1944, we can actually piece together the history of what happened to Michael Whitman.
No ad this time. On August 8, 1944, Germany's greatest tank commander, Michael Whitman, was killed in this field. So far, Norm Christie has pinpointed the positions of the British and Canadian forces, along with the final location of Whitman's tank. Now, using aerial reconnaissance photos from 1944, he will determine once and for all who killed the Black Baron. I'm with Jan Juo, and he's an expert on the battlefield here near Tinso. And he's going to help us put together the mystery of Michael Whitman. Let's look at what we got. This is the original photograph. So this shows the, how it was before. Now, this area has changed quite a lot, hasn't it? Yes, yes, in large parts, yeah. But we do have the fields where the, where the four tigers were. Yeah. That's, we're OK there. That's where Whitman's remains were found. Yeah, close and that's the road. And that's where Surge's photograph of 007 was taken. That's in correct. 45. So the other part is where the yeomanry were. Now, well, what's changed in this area? Basically, the orchard there, to the right. It's good. Right. Uh, most of them have gone, disappeared completely. So we don't know exactly where they were, but we can do it within 50 yards. Oh, yes. I think okay. so. So the next piece is, of course, the Sherbrooks. Now, that chateau and the wall, uh, a lot of that's all gone now. The Sherbrooks are going to be the challenge because we also know, don't, don't know which Sherbrooke took the shots. So let's go set it up and try to recreate this battle that really took place in about, what, 10, 12 minutes? Oh, yeah. Most. Let's go get the surveyor and find out what really happened. OK. So this is the position where 007 was knocked out. This was Whitman's tank, and this is where we're going to start our investigation. So we're going to analyze the field from really a, a line of sight, yes. from the various positions to see what they could actually see. And then we're going to use surveying and GPS to do the rest, to get our, our distances. So we can ask Vincent to set this as our original point, point zero, and then we'll go out and find the locations of the other tigers over here. So we'll head out and get to the one that was uh, due east first. Using the aerial photographs from 1944, Norm plots the field positions of the four wrecked Tigers. The Yeomanry claims that their gunner, Joe Edkins, took out Whitman along with two others. A remarkable feat, to say the least. Norm is returning to the Yeomanry's position south of saint anien to examine the battlefield from here, there to test the validity the of the British claim. Well, here's a shorter shorter doodle lead, so I'll let this one play. Hello everybody, I'm Senator Lindsey Graham running for re-election. I want you to know that my opponent... Not interested. I'm gonna back up a bit, just... Here. ...claims that their gunner, Joe Edkins, took out Whitman along with two others. A remarkable feat, to say the least. Norm is returning to the Yeomanry's position south of saint anien to examine the battlefield from there to test the validity of the British claim. So let's look at it. So we've got Syntho over here. Mm -hmm. Room is now. Okay. And we've got the Yeomanry over here all set up, nicely dug in. So they're now they're ready for any counterattack, should there be one. And of course, the Germans usually did very quickly.
We were, by midday, aware that the Germans had got to come. Couldn't leave us there any longer. There were four, certainly four Tigers, which came down on what would have been our side of the main road. I saw the three Tigers come in, come across in front of us, about 1,200 yards away. The town commander told us to wait till they got to about 800 yards. I was now starting to get a bit itchy. The tank commander said, the vast driver, and we pull out of cover. As we're pulling out of cover, he says, um, target the rear target. Can't see very much. Um, you're, you're looking through a periscope that big, at uh, 800 yards, I mean, they're only that. They're tiny, you know. I fired. As we were reversing back into cover, I'd look round at the second tank. I was probably more frightened, but I was sort of thinking, get the bastards before they get me. I fired one shot at the second tank in line. He immediately blew up. The third one, the third one definitely was milling around looking for cover. As soon as I was ready to fire, I went, all right, I fired. The yeomanry are here. They claim there's three tigers coming up, and they hit all three of them. Mm. So what's the danger area for a firefly? How far can they shoot effectively? Effectively, they would shoot at 800 meters, I would say. They could shoot at as far as uh, 1,200 meters. But from here, that would be a very, very lucky shot. Right. Um, I think we're looking at Vidman's Tiger there. Right. was about a kilometer away. So that's, well, that's, that's been solved. Can you give me the third one? 700 and uh, 67 meters. And the second one we did? 700 and 54 meters. Okay, 754. So that's this one. That's that one there. 754. How far to tank one? 775. 775. So that's within 800. That's, that's, that's a good right. distance yes. for a firefly. Now, how far is the Whitman one? 967. 967. So it's almost a, almost a kilometer, so 1,100 yards, which is at the very, very top of the, of the range for the gun. There are several things to consider. These three tigers here in the line are the closest to the uh, to this place here where yeah. uh, North Central Yeomanry was located. So it would make sense for them to have taken them out first anyway, because they are within 800 meters. Right? So from here, you would see those three tigers very clearly on the horizon as they came across. But Whitman is over the rise down towards that white building over there, Gomez Mill. You know, maybe a lucky shot would go through. That'd be a very skilled shot. But that would mean they got four tigers. So that doesn't fit with the belief of what, or what the omen we got that day. You can see why the three tigers would be sitting ducks, but the fourth one would be quite a challenge. investigation into who killed the Black Baron has pinpointed the positions of all the Tiger tanks destroyed near Sintho on August 8, 1944. And his analysis of the British Yeomanry's position south of saint denis has brought their claim into question. He's now traveling to Gosmanium to locate the position of the Canadian tanks and survey the battlefield from their perspective to determine whether they could have fired the kill shot. So. These are the grounds of the old chateau, right? Yes. Now, the wall that surrounded it, most of the northern part is gone, but the southern part is still there. We, we found that the other day. So we know that the Sherbrooks came into this area. Now, your aerial photograph shows that they made holes in some of the walls that were on the Route Nationale, which of course is right here. There's about two big holes we can see this uh, here. 
One would be uh, right in front of us, back right. here. And the other one would be a bit further to the left, that side. We came here earlier to try to find out or look for proof that the Sherbrokes were here. We found small marks, but we didn't realize at the time how much of the wall was missing. And in specifically, that there were breaks in the walls facing, facing east towards where the Tigers would have advanced. There was a couple right on the road. And it was from that general area that the first German tanks came out from Sinso. Right away, I can remember the wireless net becoming active. I can see them, I can see them. There's some tanks coming. But with my eyes, I could see the tank closest to the road, about 200 yards, I guess. I didn't fire at it, and other people from my squad were firing at it now. I don't recall the actual tank blowing up by somebody firing at him. I can remember a tremendous explosion and seeing the turret hit the ground. Are you surprised to see how close we are to Whitman's tank? Yes, I am indeed, yeah. Uh, because even when you look at the aerial photograph, it's, um, it doesn't seem uh, so close. The way I'm actually standing in the field, looking over uh, from this side to where uh, Whitman's uh, tank was destroyed, certainly looks very close indeed. So let's ask Vincent exactly how far we are from Whitman's tank. So Vincent, can you give me a uh, distance to Tiger number one, Whitman's? One on red? And 43 meters. 143 meters. That's incredibly close. So we have this situation. We know where his tank was just over here. So we have the Sherbrooke's positions here, and they're shooting in that direction towards Whitman's tank. Now you have a schematic of it. I showed a uh, drawing of a target, and Serge was actually able to draw the uh, precise area where he uh, observed a big impact, okay. which was located on the uh, left forward cooling grid. So this is left rear of Whitman's tank. So right. your trajectory would be very low here. Yes, it would. you're so close. Mm -hmm. So it's most likely then that would come from this position. Yes. And then it went in, and gradually it ignited the fuel and the ammunition, and the turret blew off. That's amazing. I'm surprised we're this close. I thought we'd be around 500 meters, and now we're 150. So really, it almost has to be the Canadians. Can you think of any alternative? Well, uh, Monsieur Varin, who took the photograph that we see here, he's actually suggested that it could have been a, a Typhoon rocket, uh, because he photographed a non-exploded Typhoon rocket that was lying nearby the tank. The reason I would doubt it is a Typhoon rocket is uh, that A, they were rippled fire, and weren't very accurate. It would be very difficult to hit the tank. The second thing is that the uh, Typhoon rocket has several pounds worth of explosive. And if the rocket hit the Tiger, the rear of the Tiger would be blown apart. Right. So you wouldn't be able to see the Harley in one so piece. There's no, there's no evidence of really burning. There's no. There's just no proof that it happened. It's no. unlikely. So we're left with really one thing here. The Canadian. The Sherbrooke's, Sherbrooke's had to do it. Yes. Having examined the battlefield from the German, British, and Canadian positions, it's now possible for the first time to reconstruct the Battle of Sintho and accurately recreate the attack that killed German Panzer ace Michael Whitman. It is now clear that Joe Ekins, from his position near saint agnac did destroy the three Titans. But it's difficult to believe Atkins could have fired the shot that killed Whitman, especially in the face of strong evidence that indicates that the fatal shot came from the direction of the Canadian tanks at Gorsmania. A position only 143 meters from the Black Baron's Tiger.
Following the Battle of saint the Allies pushed further south, continuing their advance against the remaining German units defending Normandy. In just 80 days, they completely encircled the retreating German army. The Battle of Normandy is all but over. In all, 100,000 men lose their lives, including 50,000 German soldiers. This is Lacombe German Cemetery in Normandy. It's the largest German cemetery in Normandy and it contains 21,000 graves, including two of the Tiger commanders killed August 8, 1944. This is Willy Irion. He was the commander of one of the Tigers knocked out going across the field. You can see it's a collective grave with some of his crew members here. These are always just partial remains uh, because of the fire inside the tank, as they say, brewed up, and there'd be very little after the battle to even bury. One tanker told me the story of burying his crew, and they buried them in a mess tin. You can always tell Whitman's grave because it's surrounded by flowers. Since the war, Whitman has become legendary. There are websites dedicated to him. And this is all very nice, but we should not forget what he fought for. Sometimes we have a tendency to romanticize these people when they're really fighting for Adolf Hitler. Man, respect. I respect his talent, but not, but not the man who he was. Who he, but not if he, but not the man, if he, especially if he was a monster, uh, like uh, Heinrich Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, Adolf Hitler, Reinhard Heydrich, those kind of people. You know. Respect. I, but I respect Michael Whitman's talent. This is Whitman's collective grave here, and this is where his partial remains were put in 1983. They had a large ceremony and Whitman's widow came to it and they honored him and they continue to honor him. Michael Whitman lived his life on the edge. He became famous because of his willingness to take risks, to take advantage of opportunities. But for him to make that charge towards the Canadians on Hill 112 was suicide. I have a feeling that Whitman had been in the war so long that when it got to that point, they were realizing that the war was lost. And whether his last thoughts as he went down the road were simply Valhalla, here I come. The Sherbrooke did knock out Michael Whitman. And you didn't make very much of it because none of us knew who the hell this guy was. <laughs> accepted the doctrines of uh, Hitler enough to uh, get in its tank and, and invade other people's countries, left country after country. Anybody who, who goes into another person's country to kill is a criminal. I'm trying to a hero to the Germans, but uh, not to me. Hold on, we got some report coming in. We got our report coming in. So we got. So we got, listen, we got enemy tanks coming in, so hang on. Hang on a minute, guys. You right, BRB. Okay, we got him. All right, now for the, now for the next video. Now for the next video, Michael Whitman, legend and reality, Miller's behind the Sherbrooke police here. Okay, let's see you now. Let's see this. Now this is Tom behind me. 
and farther than that is Shaw Beach, 10 miles farther. So you'll be thinking this video is supposed to be about Villa Bocard. Why we're here at Calm. So we're here to set the context. The Calm was supposed to be taken on D-Day by the 185th Brigade. That didn't happen because the 21st Panzers, although they were held up for hours, they started moving late afternoon from St. Pierre sur which is that direction. They came towards Calm, but then they had to go around to the west because Calm was full of rubble and they had headed towards Sword Beach. They came up against the British at Bursley, and they were busy. So over that way, we can see the top of the cooling tower, which was the uh, steelworks at Column Bell. And behind that, we can see a ridge, which is the ridge of Battle Wood. That became the front line for the British commandos and the British Airborne for six weeks. And the 7th Armour Division, had landed by the evening of the 7th. Now they were to sweep down to Villa Bocage, which is probably 15 miles over that way, take the high ground near Everest Sea, which is over there, Field 112, and then sweep down to Curiafro. The first British Airborne were to land in the vicinity of Everest Sea to help the 7th Armoured Division, and also to stop the 21st Panzers coming out of town westward. However, Lee Mallory refused to carry the first airborne. He said it was too dangerous for his pilot. Montgomery called him a gutless bugger. But anyway, the 30th Corps bumped down against the Panzerlier near Tilicio Sur. So on the 10th of June, Montgomery had another plan. He was going to bypass the 21st Panzer by coming round the east of Calm, past Colombelle. But the uh, trouble is in war, the enemy has its own agenda. And on the 10th of June, the Germans had planned a counterattack into the airborne sector, so that nipped Montgomery's plan in the bud. A remarkable event did happen on the 10th. Thanks to the Edlin machine and Ultra, the Allies knew exactly where Panzer West headquarters was, in a chateau near Turiaco, which is down that way and they attacked it with bombs and rockets and General Darwin and 17 other staff officers were killed and General Schwettenberg was badly wounded and all their communications were coupled. So that struck a great blow to the Panzers. The 30th Corps were bogged down against the Panzerlier in Italy sur Seul. Now the plan was hatched for the 7th Armour Division to make a right hook, come through Villa Bocage, which is where we are now, to attack Khan, and the 1st Airborne Division would be sent in to exploit their success. Now the fog of war often accounts for discrepancies in accounts of actions. I don't think that accounts for the discrepancies in who thought of this idea. Montgomery always said it was his idea, and so did General Dempsey. Now General Buckner of the 30th Corps, he said he thought of it, and so did General Erskine, the commander of the 7th Armoured Division. Anyway, the plan was hatched. The 8th Hussars set off from Jerusalem around 1600 on the 12th, where well, they came up against the German anti-tank gun at Livry. By the time the Germans had been sorted out, it was nearly 8 p.m. So Brigadier Hine decided to stop for the night. The 5.30 on the 13th, the advance continued with the 4th County of London Yeomanry leading. They got to Villa Bocage with no resistance and went through the town with the locals coming out to cheer them through. RHQ stopped here on the outskirts of the town while A Company continued straight up towards Point two one three, accompanied by the vehicles of the 1st Rifle Brigade. Now we're here more or less on the top of point 213. You see the road comes up from Villa Bocage. It would have gone straight into Villa Bocage. You can see the motorway crossing it. So they've modified the road. This is where all the vehicles are parked. 
Now three half tracks brought the platoon commanders up to the top of the hill to have an orders group. Most of the vehicles are parked off the road, so leave left hand side of the road free for the vehicles of the officers to go up and down. But here we're looking up to the top of the hill and the commander of the leading Cromwell, Lieutenant Garrett, he saw a German staff car coming from the car direction and he fired at it with a machine gun and the car screwed off the road and caught fire. So up to now, the plan was going very smoothly. On D-Day, there were no tigers in Normandy. The nearest tigers were near Belgium and that was the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion. They were told to move to Normandy to back up the Panzerlia. And the first elements, uh, Company 2, led by Michael Whitman, arrived here on the evening of the 12th. Now there's the road where A Squadron was parked. And just here, 200 yards away, there were five Tigers. Now the Tigers had had to use the roads because the round network had been sabotaged by the resistance. Now coming all that way in a 60 ton tank took a great toll on the engines and the suspension. And Whitman's tank had broken down all the way, so he was here without his tank. Six tanks had arrived, and two of those had problems. On the morning of the 13th, Lieutenant Wessel had gone off with his tank to join the Panzerlia. So there were just five here, and two with problems. The Whitman heard the tanks, the British tanks, grinding up the hill. They were surprised, they'd spent the night peacefully here. I was surprised that the British were already here. So Whitman jumped into a tank, and it was one that wouldn't work. So we then he jumped into the next tank, it was Lieutenant Soler's tank, and he left him there to tell the others what to do, and he went off to attack the British. Now he went that way, and the other two tanks went that way. Now there are differing accounts, as usual, on what happened, but I believe the Whitman came down that track. The tanks have been over there. The British column was up here. So he was at the back of the column. He attacked the first tank he met, which was a Cromwell, from the back. And the next tank was a Firefly. The Firefly was a tank that could take on the Tiger. The Firefly was traversing its turret, because it was over facing the other way. And Whitman hit it and the tank brewed up and screwed across the road, blocking the road, so stopping any vehicles coming down the road or any vehicles going up the road to help the men. And then he turned, they went down back towards Villa Bocage and there was the vehicles of the 1st Rifle Brigade there and he attacked those and then carried on into Villa Bocage. Now the other two Tigers came up the lane, which is parallel to the road, comes up over there. They came across this land here. Now they were at the head of the column. They could go down the road, firing at all the tanks and half tracks, and it was those two that knocked out this column. Now during the Tiger's rampage, many of the men had left their vehicles to take refuge in the ditches and the fields. But as soon as the Tigers had stopped firing, Panzer Grenadier troops turned up to round up the men to be prisoners. One man was decided not to be taken prisoner, it was Captain Milner. He was helping the crew of the Cromwell, and then when the fighting died down, he saw some men in the middle of the road with berries on. He was walking towards them, and he suddenly realised they were a German tank crew. So he dashed through the hedge into the field over there, and instead of running down the hill towards where the British were, he was running up the hill the other side of the hedge, and there was a German in the road running parallel to him, saying, Englishman surrender, Englishman surrender. And then the German stopped to talk to a driver in the Volkswagen, and Milner thought it was his time of glory. So he stood up, he was going to spray him with his Sten gun. But as often happened, the bloody thing jammed. So Milner decided it was time to get away. So he went down that lane then, and uh, his advance was hindered by smoke shells fired by the British who thought that would be help anybody to get away. And he finally laid down, slept a bit, waited till night time. 
and then he came back towards the road. He crossed over the road and he thought he was going to use the track where the tigers had been to get to the south of Villa Bocage and back to the British and he managed to do it. You can imagine the shock of the British troops. They'd come through Villa Bocage, being cheered by the people, no resistance. Come up this hill, no resistance. They were just parked by the side of the road, relaxing, waiting for their officers to finish their meeting. And suddenly there was a tiger right in their midst. After having shot up the vehicles of the 1st Rifle Brigade, Whitman came into town and there were the stewards here, who were no match for anything. They were soon burning. Then there was a group of Cromwells, and Captain Dyer's was with all the others trying to reverse. But the Cromwell is a very fast tank going forward, but going backwards is very slow. Captain Dyer's managed to reverse into a garden, which was about where that bend is. And uh, he saw the tiger go past with his flank exposed, but he couldn't fire at it because his gunner had gone to relieve himself. So Captain Dyer's decided that once the gunner came back, they'd follow the tiger down the road into town and they'd attack its weak rear end. B Squadron was just entered the town from the west, led by Sergeant Lockwood's Firefly. They'd been warned by Colonel Pierce of the situation. Lockwood could just see Whitman's tiger coming down the end of the street and he fired at it. Now the Firefly had a formidable punch but when the gun fired, all the crew covered their ears and closed their eyes. And when they could open their eyes again, it was difficult to see where the shell had hit. But anyway, Whitman, seeing that there was a dangerous tank at the end of the road, realised he should turn around and went back towards Hill 213. Well, that was bad news for Captain Dias in his Cromwell. He'd been following the Tiger he wanted to attack the weak rear end and now he found himself faced with the front end of the Tiger. Whitman fired for a shell and the Cromwell exploded. Dias was thrown out the turret. Well, Whitman's luck was running out. As he approached the road to Dyer, which is just where that water tower is, there was a six pounder anti-tank gun there. Now a six pounder anti-tank gun couldn't do much more damage than a Cromwell gun could but they fired at Whitman's Tiger and they knocked the track off so the Tiger was disabled. The Whitman and his crew, they got out taking their personal weapons with them and they went back to the Panzerliers headquarters at the Chateau d'Aubois. In the afternoon there was a fierce tank battle between the British tanks and the Panzers which resulted in Villa Bocage being taken back by the Germans and they held it till August the 4th. But it wasn't completely one-sided. A Mark IV and six Tigers were disabled during the battle. One particular incident is worth recounting. A firefly was advancing down the main street and nearly got caught in a trap by a Tiger. The commander happened to see through two windows he gave a view into the side street. He saw the tiger was waiting for him. He backed up the firefly and he got a shot through both windows onto the tiger. The tower was badly damaged and then later it was completely flattened by the Allies bombing it. That's where all the buildings are post-war. So we see, as often happens, reality doesn't quite live up to the legend. Whitman initiated the attack against the A troop, but he didn't knock out the whole column with just one tank. And he didn't participate in the battle in the afternoon, even though Nazi propaganda tried to make us believe that. Whitman never said he took part in battle, and if he had, he would have had to overrule his superior officer, Captain Mobius. The Whitman was active over the next two months during the Battle of Normandy, but no stories stand out until the 8th of August. 
So that's telling Port to South Akan again on the 8th of August. Here we are back again to the view over Khan. So just a reminder, if you give a thumbs up and tap the subscribe button and the bell if you haven't already, to so be informed of the videos. Another aside, to point out this field is uh, linen or flax. Normally is the biggest producer of flax in France. They make bread from it and sent off to China to do that. It's only in flour for about a week. We're lucky to see the flowers. Anyway, <coughs> over there, we can see the hospital at Khan, just to the north of Khan, and it's by point 67, which the British took on the 8th of July, just the day before they went half of Khan. And over that way, we can see the cooling tower of the steelworks at Colombel, and that's in the British airborne sector. The car was finally taken with Operation Goodwood on the 19th of July. So it had been taken, half of it had been taken on the 9th. The Germans did half the town to the 19th. So Operation Goodwood, they swept round the side and the Canadians come in from the other side and they took Khan and the idea was to carry on to Calais. As, as I often say, that didn't happen. Anyway, Khan was taken on the 19th of July and then they were planning Operation Totalize and that was going to get Calais. The Operation Totalize started on the 9th of the 7th of August 11 o'clock at night and the Canadians and the British had 700 tanks so they were at uh, Dubert Folly which is just on the outskirts of Khan and 11 o'clock at night they started off and they were guided by cannons on the flank firing tracer shells so they were just to drive south and uh, hopefully they'd end up at the lake but uh, being all this it was very dry, a lot of dust flying up, so some tanks were banging into other tanks, some tanks went into traces. It was rather chaotic. But the tanks of this sector objective, one was a troop with uh, Ken South in it. They, they were in the Northampton Yeomanry. Ken South wrote several books. One of them was called uh, Tank, it was about this incident. Another one was called uh, the Battle for City 10 South in it. They were in the Northampton Yeomanry. 10 South wrote several books. One of them was called uh, Hank, was about the thing to do. Another one was called uh, the Battle for City La Campagne, which is a village just over there. Not to be confused with the city of Stern. It was in the Northampton Yeomanry. And their troop had Sherman and one Firefly. So the Firefly had a 17 pounder gun, which was practically equal to the German 88mm gun. The Firefly can knock out the Tiger. Now they set off from Hubert Folly, which is just a few miles over that way. They set going south, came along this road, and taken fire from the Germans over here. Nothing serious, they carried on. Their objective was St. Emilion de Feminine and they arrived there in the early morning of the 8th. During the early morning they arrived on this ridge of St. Emilion de Feminine. Now one of the tankers saw a German across the valley in the woods there. The German had left his group of soldiers and he dropped his pants to relieve himself. Now he could have taken a pot shot at him but you can't shoot somebody in that position, so he survived that particular time. So the terrain's changed quite a bit since 1944. There were orchards here at the time. But Joe Aiken's tank was probably found about here. 
you from here, you've got a good view onto the main road over there. There's the Chateau of Gormenil. Around midday, five tigers are seen coming down parallel to the road over there, or the calm. And when they came into range, Joe Aitken fired at them. He knocked out at least three. As he didn't know at the time. But these are the tanks of Michael Whitman. And this is where Michael Whitman was killed. Now for many years, Joe Aitken was credited as having killed Michael Whitman. Probably Michael Whitman's tank. Skin. These are the tanks of Michael Whitman. And this is where Michael Whitman was killed. Now for many years, Joe Aitken was credited as having killed Michael Whitman. Probably is Michael Whitman's tank, which is just outside the range of Joe Aitken's firefly. And here's a photo of what happened when the tiger is just too far away. Now this road has changed shape since 1944. The bit we can see was like that. And in 1944, it went straight across where the fields are now, towards the buildings over there. Now there were three tigers along here. There were two to the left there, and then one to the right of the road. They were in range of Joe Aiken, who was just over there, where his woods are. So there's the Chateau of Gormenin. A Whitman's tank was just here, by this building. And over there, in the distance, is where Joe Aiken's tank was. The other three tigers were in between here and there. So the Whitman's tank was a bit far away from Aiken to be hit by Aiken. But uh, if it wasn't Aiken, who did it? But just the other side of the road, see there's the Chateau Dominin. So across there is where Whitman's tank was. And just here is the Chateau Dominin. See, there's still a wall along here. In 44, the wall was a lot longer. It went along this way. And behind the wall were the Shermans of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, the Canadians. Now, they didn't have fireflies. They had 75mm guns on their Shermans. But from that range, they could knock out Whitman's tank. Now, the question's even more complicated because some people say a typhoon hit it with a rocket but there's no record of a typhoon flying over here on that day at that time so i think it's the canadians This is Canto from where Whitman left. He was here with the infamous Kurt Meyer. There are still traces of the German occupation. Now they didn't find Whitman's body until 1983 when they redid the road to make it into a four lane highway from Falaise to Calm. They found a mass grave of German bodies. It was actually his wife that identified his body. Because surprisingly enough for a SS, perfect Aryan, he had a short leg. And so he had a built up heel on his, one of his boots. And his wife recognized his boot. That's how she identified him. So then he was buried in the German cemetery at La Combe.
August 1944, the battle for Normandy is raging. The Allied forces landed two months before, but the Germans have successfully bottled up the beachhead, bogging the British and Americans down in fighting in the close Bocage country and in numerous shattered towns and villages. But the British and Canadians in the north have launched a strong attempt to break out past the ravaged city of Caen. The Germans are hard pressed to prevent this strong armoured move. The 12th SS Panzergrenadier Division Hitler Jugend has been bled white defending Caen, and on the 7th of August, heavy SS Panzer Battalion 101 is attached to the division, in position halfway between Caen and Falaise. Consisting of Tiger 1 tanks, the heavy SS Panzer Battalion 101's job is to protect the Hitler Jugend's right flank and occupy heights north of the village of Santo. SS Oberfuhrer Kurt Meyer, commanding the Hitler Jugend Division, knows his battle group is too weak to put up a strong defense and decides instead to use his few Tigers and other armor to attack the British and Canadian divisions massing before him in the hope of disrupting their assault. This attack should buy time for fresh German divisions to come up and build good defenses behind Meyer's position. Among the officers of SS Heavy Panzer Battalion 101 is Germany's highest scoring tank ace, SS Hauptsturmführer Michael Wittmann, who only days before had destroyed 25 British armoured vehicles in an almost single-handed Tiger action at the village of Villa Bocage, earning the swords to his Knight's Cross and Oak Leaves and promotion to captain. In total, Wittmann had destroyed around 138 enemy tanks, mostly on the Eastern Front. Any careful planning for the projected attack by the Hitler Jugend battle group is spoiled by the appearance overhead of a solitary B-17 bomber that starts dropping flares. The SS move fast. A large airstrike will obviously arrive in about 10 minutes. Meyer decides to attack at once. At 12.30, he shakes Wittmann's hand and the ace clambers aboard Tiger 007 and heads off into battle. Wittmann commanded a force of four Tiger 1s. They moved out in a column heading north-northwest and soon came under heavy British artillery fire but this did not stop them. Firing at the extreme range of 1,800 meters, Wittmann's group brought Sherman tanks of the Canadian Sherbrooke Fusiliers Regiment under fire, knocking some of them out. Rolling on, Wittmann's tanks continued northwest, but they were unaware that A Squadron, the British Northamptonshire Yeomanry, were parked in concealed positions to Wittmann's northeast. A Squadron's number three troop is commanded by Lieutenant James and equipped with three standard 75mm gun armed Sherman tanks and one Sherman Firefly. The Firefly was the British response to dealing with better armoured and gun German tanks like the Panther and the Tiger. With a larger turret, the Firefly mounted a 17-pounder anti-tank gun capable of knocking out most German tanks. As Lieutenant James and the other tank commanders watched through binoculars, the Tigers drove on, exposing their more lightly armoured flanks to the fire of the British tanks. 
The Firefly, commanded by Sergeant Gordon, had spotted the Tigers at a range of 1,200 meters. He immediately radioed A Squadron headquarters to report. He was told to hold his fire until the second in command, Captain Boardman, arrived. Boardman, aboard his own Sherman, drove up as German artillery and mortar fire plastered number three troops' position. The British decided to wait until the Tigers came closer before opening fire. Even as the range wound down, Sergeant Gordon told the other Shermans to hold their fire. His Firefly would do all the shooting initially as the only tank capable of dealing it out to Wittmann's Tigers. At 12.39 p.m. at a range of 800 meters, Gordon ordered his Firefly forward to the edge of the orchard. Trooper Joe Eakins, Gordon's gunner, took aim at the last Tiger, Gordon hoping that the other Tigers wouldn't register his attack immediately. Eakins fired. The loader slammed another AP shell into the breach and Eakins fired again. The targeted Tiger burst into flames. Gordon ordered his tank reverse back into cover. But the next Tiger's turret began to rotate to deal with the new threat. It fired, the big 88mm round missing. German fired twice more, but didn't hit the Firefly. The Sergeant Gordon was injured. Standing in the turret, he was struck by something and bailed out only to be wounded by shrapnel. Troop Commander Lieutenant James dismounted from his own tank and ran over to the Firefly, clambering into the turret to assume command, ordering the driver to move the tank to a fresh firing position. By 12.47, the Firefly was ready to resume fighting. James ordered the Firefly out from cover. Eakins sighting his gun on the second Tiger which had 007 painted on the sides of the turret. It was Michael Wittmann's tank. James gave the order to fire. Tiger 007 erupted into a fireball, and seconds later, its turret was blown clean off as the Firefly shell set off stored ammunition. Wittmann was killed instantly. James ordered the Firefly back into cover. The other Shermans now engaged the remaining Tigers. Shortly after, Ekin stopped another Tiger with his 17-pounder. It burst into flames. It was 12.52. In less than a quarter of an hour, Trooper Ekins had dispatched three Tigers using just five shells. He ended his streak by knocking out two Panzer IVs at 1,645 meters. Ekins, a factory worker from Northamptonshire, had dispatched Germany's greatest tank ace. With evidently a crack shot, Curiously, the Army detailed Egins to be a tank radio operator for the remainder of the war. Wittmann's remains were recovered, and today he is buried in a communal grave close to where Tiger 007 blew up. As for Trooper Egins, he lived to the ripe old age of 88 and passed away in 2012. Please do subscribe, share, and also support me on Patreon. Many thanks. Hey everybody, my name is Richard Smith, I'm the director of the Tank Museum. This week marks the 75th anniversary of VE Day and today we're going to look at one incident which provides an insight into how the British defeat the German army in the Second World War. The incident that we're going to be looking at today will be well known to a number of people watching this video. What we're going to be talking about is two soldiers and two tanks and how the British, with a little bit of help from others, uh, win the war. And for the sake of the argument, I'm going to be treating the Canadians as honorary British. Uh, they, I'm sure, would appreciate that. Um, and to be honest, anyone else who's on the winning side counts as honorary British. Now, the two soldiers we're going to be looking at today could not have been more different. The first one is a chap called Michael Wittmann. He was one of the most famous tank commanders of the Second World War. Uh, Wittmann was credited with uh, over 140 tank kills uh, for the German army. Uh, he was a professional soldier. He served 
with the SS Liebstandarte, which was kind of Hitler's bodyguard. He was a, a decorated propaganda hero. Uh, there's a story of uh, when he met Hitler to receive uh, one of his versions of the Knight's Cross. Uh, Hitler noticed that Wittmann was missing a tooth and arranged for his own dentist to fix Wittmann's teeth in, char in time for the wedding. And this guy, Michael Wittmann, uh, was broadly seen then and now as the pinnacle of the Nazi war machine. Our second soldier has rarely been touted as the pinnacle of the British war machine. His name was Joe Eakins. Now Joe uh, was someone we got to know very well here at the Tank Museum uh, over many years. Uh, Joe worked in a shoe factory at the beginning of the war and uh, he worked in Northamptonshire, which is the traditional home of British shoemaking. The factory that Joe worked in actually made army boots. And Joe was what's uh, in what's known as a reserved profession. And in a reserved profession, you don't have to join the army. You're kind of protected from joining the army. So Joe could have stayed the entire war in relative safety. However, he chose to join up. He volunteered because he'd seen what the Nazis had been doing in Europe and felt that it was the right thing to do to do his part to try and stop them. So Joe joined the local uh, regiment. He joined the Northamptonshire Yeomanry, an organisation that at the time described themselves as a hunting regiment, which shows how seriously they took mechanisation. Uh, he came down to Bovington, uh, where we are, uh, to train on tanks. And he trained in all areas of tank operations, driving, communications and gunnery. Uh, Joe wasn't awfully impressed by the level of training uh, he received. He, he recalled later that they only went to the ranges a handful of times uh, to practice gunnery. And each time they went to the ranges, they only fired about five shots. However, uh, he completed his training and then went to Normandy and to serve as the gunner on a Sherman Firefly. And uh, even on this transition, he identified the fact they only went to the ranges once with the Firefly for the familiarisation. And he fired a grand total of five practice shots from the Firefly. So you've got two soldiers, Pinnacle and Nazi War Machine, Michael Wittman and Joe Eakins, reluctant amateur. And on the 8th of August 1944, Joe went into his first major action and came across Michael Wittmann. Now the action that he was taking part in was an operation called Operation Totalize. And operation Totalize was one of a series of battles fought by the British to try and smash their way out of the Normandy beachhead. Now, during this process they seem to have an odd habit of naming battles after horse races which I must say I'm still slightly mystified about um, but breaking out of the Normandy beachhead was no easy task and the British learned some very very hard lessons along the way as they moved from operation naivety, operational naivety to become a genuinely formidable fighting force. At the beginning of these breakout attempts the British are essentially far too easily caught out. Uh, Operation Purge, named after a fish. Um, in mid-June, the British tried to punch their way out of the beachhead. Initially went quite well. And having done quite well and reached their initial objective, they stopped for a cup of tea at a place called Villa Bocage. And as an illustration of German dastardliness, the Germans then counter-attack while the British are having tea. It's an appalling war crime. And the German counterattack at Villa Bocage was led by Michael Wittmann. And Wittmann essentially takes out or takes on the majority of a British armoured brigade. He, he goes down the middle of the high street in Villa Bocage, taking out British uh, tanks and armoured vehicles. Um, and Wittmann's in a, a Tiger One, and arguably the most formidable fighting machine in the world at the time. And an example of uh, how formidable this was, was as he was driving down the high street of Villa Bocage, uh, down a side road, 
uh, there's a British tank commander, a guy called Pat Dyess, and Pat Dyess sees this tiger drive down the road uh, at the end of the street that he's on um, and realises there's a, there's a bit of a problem going on here. Uh, so Dyess gathers his crew together, which takes him a little while because his, his gun has gone for a wee. And he gets his crew together, he gets into his Cromwell tank, and they set off to pursue uh, Vitman and his tiger. Uh, unfortunately for Pat Dyess, by the time uh, he's got his crew together, Vitman has clearly got bored and has turned round and is coming back the other way. Um, and Pat Dyer's uh, accounts for the next few minutes with these words. He says, I, I saw the tiger coming down the street towards me. I fired at him twice. Both shots bounced off, which was a bit disheartening. The tiger then fired at me once, and his shot did not bounce off. And, and Pat Dyer continues to say, oh, he gets blown out of the top of the turret and most of his crew are killed. So Vitman he's led this astonishing counter-attack at Villa Bocage. It's, it's the pinnacle of his reputation. This guy is a formidable operator. But by the time we get to the 8th of August, things have changed, and the British in particular have become significantly more sophisticated. So Operation Totalize is quite different. Operation Totalize is a night attack led by the Canadians, as I said, honorary British. Um, and it uses all sorts of innovations to try and overcome the difficulties that they've had in previous assaults. So they're using new types of compasses, they're, they're, they're orientating their attack uh, by using a different kind of tracer at night. Uh, the, the fact it's a night attack at all is actually a really difficult kind of operation uh, to perform, but they try and reduce the complexity by bouncing searchlights off the clouds to create artificial moonlight. This is, there's a lot of thought, a lot of planning, a lot of innovation going to this attack. And once again, they punch through German lines. But instead of stopping for a brew, uh, while they're waiting for the next phase of the attack to start, they're, they're waiting at the spearhead of a place called saint Hengon. While they're waiting for that next phase, instead of stopping for a cup of tea, they're setting up the mother of all ambushes. They're getting into a position to expect that German counterattack to come in. And lo and behold, the next thing that happens is that the British have reached their target, they're waiting, and then here comes the German counterattack, led by Michael Fitman with his company of tigers. So you've got Joe Eakins is in an orchard, in a firefly, waiting, and then they see this group of tiger tanks heading towards them. What happens in the following 12 minutes is that Joe Eakins fires five shots and knocks out three Tigers. Now this is one of the most astonishing feats of gunnery of the Second World War, is hitting these guys from roughly double the normal range for an engagement in, for tanks uh, in Normandy. He, Joe is clearly a natural shot, and this is in a, a period, remember, when the, the accepted exchange rate between Tigers and Shermans was to lose at least three Shermans, knock out one Tiger. Joe's taking out three in five shots, he actually subsequently takes on a fourth German tank, Panzer IV, later on in the same day. Now, the three Tiger tanks that, my, that Joe Eakins uh, knocked out probably included Michael Vittman. Opinions do vary on this. Uh, you can tell from the documentary makers. So if there's a documentary uh, done by someone with a Canadian accent, they assume that Vittman is knocked out by the Sherbet Fusiliers. If your documentary maker has a British accent, then Michael Vittman is knocked out by Joe Eakins. You'll notice I have a British accent. There are no Canadians on this video, and therefore, for the sake of this video, I win. Joe Eakins knocks out Michael Vittman. Now, as I said, this is one of the great acts of gunnery of the Second World War. This is an astonishing feat for someone with such little practice time as Joe. Um, it is, of course, the British army that Joe is part of, um, and therefore, having carried out one of the great acts of gunnery of the Second World War, literally the next day, Joe was transferred to being a radio operator and never fired another shot. He remained slightly cheesed off about that pretty much until he died. So, but let's reflect on this. What does this incident mean? So, the key part here is Joe wins. So, Joe Eakins, the reluctant amateur, takes on and defeats the pinnacle of the Nazi war machine. But he doesn't win because he gets lucky. He wins 
for very good reasons. And I think there are three reasons that Joe wins that day. And those are three reasons that also echo throughout the Northwest European campaign and the defeat of Nazi Germany. My first reason for Joe's victory that day is that Joe is in a good piece of equipment. So Joe is in a Sherman Firefly, and this is one of my favourite examples of British engineering and how it works during wartime. So what you've got the Sherman Firefly is you take a whole bunch of existing things that are a really good platform in a Sherman. It's a reliable, cost-efficient, easy-to-maintain, easy-to-operate vehicle, but it's under gun. But the British also have this great big anti-tank gun, the 17-pound and with the Sherman Firefly, somehow they managed to fix this huge 17 pounder gun into a Sherman chassis and produce a really good tank killer. And that 17 pounder gun, arguably the best gun of the time uh, in the Second World War, is it's at higher muzzle velocity uh, than the Tiger's 88. Uh, and with the uh, armor piercing discarding Sabo round, this is a really, really efficient tank killing weapon. So, Joe is in a good tank. The Sherman Firefly, this shows the myth of Allied tanks not being good enough. This was a tank that really was good enough. Second, Joe's operating in what I consider to be a superior tactical system to that of his opponent. Now this for me is where it gets really interesting. You see, the British Army in Normandy was a learning organisation and the British Army learns quicker than the German army. This is the same with the Americans as well. You see, at Villa Bocard, the British have been caught out by a counterattack. So the German doctrine is, uh, if you get attacked, you immediately counterattack to, to, to retake that ground. Now, only a few weeks later, between 13th of June and 8th of August, you can see how much the British have learned that instead of just having a cup of tea and waiting, that they're setting up their ambush, they're expecting that German counterattack. And it comes down to doctrine and how it works. Now, if you want to learn more about doctrine and how it works and the effectiveness of armour in Normandy for the British, uh, I really recommend the work of a guy called Professor John Buckley at Wolverhampton University. He's done some really excellent work in this area. So what you've got here with doctrine is that everybody who fights in Normandy, everyone who fights in the Northwest European campaign goes in with loads of doctrine. Nobody is short of doctrine in the Second World War. And the commonality across everyone's doctrine is that everyone's doctrine turns out to be wrong because no one was expecting to fight in the bocage, in this, in this close Normandy countryside. So all of the doctrine, even though it had been written by the best people available to everyone at the time, it's all wrong. So therefore, the real challenge is who can get rid of that wrong doctrine quickly and come up with something new. And then yes, what this comes down to is, is how different people view doctrine and rules. So you see, Germans love rules. The Germans are great at doing doctrine. The British are quite different. The British, when you present them with a set of rules, treat your new rules as an interesting suggestion. But have you thought of, and then they come up with something quite sensible. It was one of the things that makes us really difficult to manage. But because of this kind of sceptical British approach to rules, it turns out that if the doctrine is wrong, you can revise the way you work really rather quickly and if you want to look closely at how the British go about fighting in Normandy what's actually happening on the ground is really rather sophisticated so the doctrine is wrong but you get individual units and subunits coming up with new methods of fighting which are absolutely bleeding edge you're talking about you know, integral artillery and, um, uh, regimental and squadron level uh, you're doing really sophisticated uh, infantry tank operation again at this low level um, you're, uh, the, the formation of battle groups is all going on in the British Army but it's just not documented very well because the guys are winging it so this meant that the British Army could evolve very quickly and was nowadays what we call a highly agile organisation the, and, and the Germans actually can't get their heads around the fact 
that their opponent is evolving quickly. And that means that the Germans themselves prove very vulnerable. And Wittmann himself is a great example of how the Germans do not evolve and therefore get defeated. And actually, the American historian Stephen Zaloga makes the, what I think, key observation that when the Germans are fighting against the British in Normandy, Michael Wittmann, for all his, uh, his skill and all his reputation, Michael Wittmann only lasts two months. So we've got a good piece of equipment, we've got a superior tactical system, but the third, and for me, arguably the most important feature that explains how the British win against the Germans in Normandy, is, is this one. And that's that Joe Eakins was in the most dangerous place in the world that day. He was not only at the front between the, the two fighting forces in Normandy, but he was at the Schwerpunkt, he was at the absolute tip of the, the focus of a German counterattack. This was a lethal place to be. And Joe was from a liberal democracy. He was a volunteer chosen to be there. And if he'd run away, he would not have been shot. But Joe chose to be brave and chose to fight. And when we reflect on this, it's, it was not that Joe wasn't scared. I said in a, an earlier video, I asked Joe what it was like that day. And his response was, bloody frightening, I can tell you. And after the event, he was saying that the, uh, they, he was physically shaking. It was a combination of fear and adrenaline. This was a terrifying experience. But Joe fought it out in the most dangerous place in the world at the front of the battle. Now, that, there were brave men on all sides in every army in World War II. But Joe was on the right side of history. Uh, if it hadn't been for Joe and thousands of people like him, the world would look like a very, very different place today. And the day and the, the, the commemorations that we have this week would simply not have been possible. Now, that's not the end of our story because Joe was never formally recognised for what he did. And his, his account of it, he gave to me later on, was that uh, uh, his day, in his unit that day, only one guy got a medal, and that was actually the commander of his tank who got injured and had gone to the back. Uh, so Joe never got formally recognised. But when we opened our tank story hall, the, the centrepiece of the Tank Museum in 2009, the Queen came down to do the opening. And we had the opportunity to introduce a number of people to her. And that day, we only introduced one veteran to the Queen, and that was Joe. And Joe had the opportunity in person to tell his story to the Queen. And I spoke to him afterwards and he said that that day had been the proudest day of his life. And when I think about why we operate the Tank Museum, why we tell the stories we tell, why we do what we do, I look at that moment and I say, that's why. Thank you very much. Here at the Tank Museum, we are trying to produce a wider range of online content while the museum is closed because of coronavirus. And over this period, it would be wonderful if you could support us through any means that you can, in particular through Patreon, through joining our friends, or through buying things like Tank Museum slippers in our online shop. Thank you very much for your support. Summer in 1944 in France. The Allies are on the offensive to try and... Now let's talk about more... Now let's talk about that guy, Joe Atkins. He's, he's also a shoemaker. So let's see. Summer in 1944 in France. The Allies are on the offensive to try and break through the German defences south of Caen. A group of British tanks sit under cover in an orchard when, over the rise, three Tiger tanks appear. Their Maybach engines roaring, and the screech of their tracks can be heard in the distance. Back in the orchard, inside one of the tanks, a Sherman Firefly sits Joe Eakins in the gunner position. What happens next will be analysed for years to come. The tank commander orders the Sherman to come out of cover, and a nervous Joe is ordered to fire two rounds at the rear Tiger. This is only the second time Joe has fired this gun, and the first time in a combat situation. The impact of Joe's shots on this day will be felt all the way to Berlin. Joe Eakins was working in a shoe factory at the age of 17 when he volunteered to join the 1st Northamptonshire Yeomanry after hearing what was happening in Europe at the start of the war. 
He felt he had a moral obligation to play a part in the struggle to defeat the Germans and their ideology. Eakins was assigned as a gunner in a Sherman Firefly in A Squadron. Fireflies were Sherman tanks adapted by the British to have the powerful 17-pounder anti-tank gun fitted. The tank became known as the Firefly because of the bright flash it gave off from the muzzle. It was a hastily put together solution in order to resolve the problem of the highly effective German armor. Winston Churchill gave the project the highest priority. The Firefly could penetrate 233 millimeters of armor at 1,000 meters distance. On the downside, the recoil and the dust thrown up when it was fired was incredible. It would jar the crew, and if fired at night, the extremely bright flash would cause night blindness if the crew didn't shut their eyes at the moment of firing. In Joe's squadron, there were only three fireflies, and the rest of the squadron were regular Shermans. All the tanks were named after Russian towns in honor of the Soviet allies. Joe's tank was called Velikia Luki, after a Russian town where a fierce battle had been fought. The Fireflies had only been ready six weeks before the squadron was deployed, and Joe had only one session on the firing range in his tank. During the later stages of Operation Overlord on August the 8th, 1944, Joe's squadron was ordered to the south of Khan. The squadron were dispersed in a defensive position, which left Joe under cover of the orchard with two regular Shermans. When three Tigers appeared in the distance, only Joe's tank was able to reach them. Thanks to the tank museum, we have permission to use this recording they made of Joe in April 2009, where we hear him describe the battle in his own words. We were in the orchard, undercover, looking out over a couple of thousand yards of fairly flat line land. Suddenly there were three tigers coming across our front, about 1,200 yards, three in line, some distance between them. We waited until they were about 800 yards. My tank commander pulled us out of the orchard because you had to move out to the far. Uh, he said, target the rear one, and not fired two shots at him and hit him, and they went on far. He fired, and then he got back in the cold as quick as he could. They were 800 yards, they were only tiny, <laughs> but I could see the gun coming round. They fired at us, and uh, I don't know whether they fired two or three shots or what. At this point, Joe's tank was hit in the turret, but the tank was still operational. We'd always been told that it took five Shermans to knock out one tiger. And I'd imagined that I'd get some help. We'd got two other fireflies in the squadron because the ordinary Sherman at 300 yards could perhaps do a bit of damage, but 800 yards of it just bounced off. So I realised, oh, I'm here. So we pulled out anyway again and uh, fired at the second time, hit him with the first shot and went up in the explosion. So obviously, we hit the ammunition or something. By this time, the first tank of the three realised, I think, what was going on. And he started milling around looking for cover, so he turned a bit towards us. But we pulled out and fired two shots at him and I hit him as well. And he went up and I thought, thank God it's not going to be us today. We pulled back again into the orchard and uh, sat and shook. <laughs> Relieved, you know, you were frightened, but I know you could do it. I did go and do it. What else could you do, you know? A certain amount of excitement, I suppose. You couldn't run anywhere, they were nowhere to run. In just 12 minutes, Joe had taken out three tigers. Unbeknownst to Joe, inside one of the tanks destroyed that day had been the Black Baron, Michael Whitman. Whitman was a household name in Germany and a cult figure as a panzer ace. He was one of the most successful tank commanders ever and was credited with destroying an incredible 138 tanks. After this incident, and despite his expert shooting, Joe was assigned to be a radio operator for the rest of the war. He was baffled as to why he was put in this role. In 1945, Joe left the army due to illness. He went back to the shoe factory and married Gwen, his sweetheart, in 1946. They had children, and he rose to be a manager at several shoe factories. Due to the importance and notoriety of Whitman, after the war there were several claims as to who had destroyed the Black Baron's tank. The 4th Canadian Armoured Division, later the 1st Polish Armoured Division made a claim, and the 144th Regiment Royal Armoured Corps also claimed credit. The RAF claimed a rocket fired from a Hawker Typhoon from the 2nd Tactical Air Force hit Whitman's tank. But eight years after the battle, Joe Eakins was told by historians that it was most likely that he had taken down the Black Baron in the second of the three tanks he had shot, 
His comrades convinced him that he should come forward and speak about the battle, particularly as others were claiming that they had brought down the Black Baron. Eventually, Joe conceded and spoke to the Tank Museum and the press about his part. Even then, Joe was characteristically modest about the whole thing, saying, In a battlefield, I don't think anyone can really be 100% certain what happened, but most historians now seem pretty sure it was me. In 1988, he retired. He held a black belt in judo and was given the Queen's Jubilee Medal for services to sport. On a visit to the Tank Museum in 2000, Joe was given the opportunity to fire the gun of a Challenger II, the tank the British Army uses today. Not surprisingly, the then 78-year-old hit the target first time and became the oldest gunner of a Challenger II. There is only one working Tiger I left in the world today, and you can go and visit it at the Tank Museum Tiger I left hit the target first time and became the oldest gunner of a Challenger II. There is only one working Tiger I left in the world today and you can go and visit it at the Tank Museum in Bovington and see it in action on Tiger Day. You can find out more about the Tank Museum and support the great work they do by visiting patreon.com forward slash tank museum. Italian, so I'm gonna, so I gotta take, so I gotta take a, take a short break and get, take care of these, take care of these enemies. So be, so BRB. And I turned, sorry everybody, it turned out to be a false alarm. All right, back. Now, where were we? Oh, yeah. You know, I almost forgotten something. Hold on, I get, hold on, I'm getting a mess with my commander. Hang, hang on. Oh, wait. Never, never mind. No, it's not. It was nothing. It was nothing. So let's take a look at. So what would the trailer of this movie look like? We're still pro we're probably still in the information phase, but now we're probably moving to the movie phase. So let's take a look. Joe Eakins regards as a misrepresentation of events and his views. He has put the full story of his battle with Michael Vittman during the Allied attempts to break out from the Normandy beachhead on record. And then we went into the village and through the village, uh, into the orchard, there were orchards all around the other side of the village, which looked out on a, a quite flat, open area. The story is to be told of the paths that led the natural soldier and knight of the Nazi Empire, Michael Wittmann, to meet a reluctant soldier and shoemaker from Northamptonshire in a bloody encounter in the fields south of the city of Caen. The German Tiger tank, as commanded by Michael Wittmann, saw successfully on the Eastern Front and later in Normandy. 36 tons of Teutonic nastiness. Joe's testimony is married up with expert analysis of terrain and weapons, while other witnesses' accounts of Operation Total Eyes and maps are used to examine the battlefield in detail.
This program will be available as a DVD, direct from Penance or Digital, or any good retailer. Alternatively, it will be available as a normal internet download from Battlefield History. Now, what would a move? What would a now? That's good. That'd be a good. Tra that's kind of a good. Be on. That'd be kind of a good trailer. That is a good trailer, to be honest with you. Now, what would a movie like this look like? Okay. I was thinking of it'd be kind of like this movie, but different in a way. And I'll explain different, different after I show you, after I show you it. Germans capture this city. The entire country will collapse. I want our boys to resist. We need our heroes. Do you know the heroes? I know one. Armed only with a rifle, he quickly made the Nazi invader realize that from now on, the only way was back. Vasily! Vasily! It's seen the way people look at you as if you mean something, something bigger than yourself. The whole country is looking at you. Those snipers are demoralizing my army. They send their top marksman. It seems he's come all the way from Berlin to stop you. How are you going to go about finding this young Russian? I'll fix it so that he's the one who finds me. A battle between two nations became a conflict between two men. I don't stand a chance against this man. If you kill him, you can win the war for us. You've promised people a victory I can't deliver. And is there a girl he loves in his village? Not in his village, here. Does she love him? Paramount Pictures and Mandalay Pictures present Joseph Fiennes. She believes in you. Jude Law. You've built me up and up into someone I'm not. Rachel Weiss. It seems your destinies are entwined. Bob Hoskins. Where is he? Where is Vasily? He's dead. And Ed Harris. He isn't dead. Because I haven't killed him yet. A hero never chooses his destiny. Destiny chooses him. Enemy at the gates. You can buy a renter right here. But now let me explain what what, what would be darn it. In this now let me explain what would be what would be different about it. About the video. First off, it'd be first off, it'd be one. It'd be Michael Whit. It'd be Michael Whit Whitman. Whit the majority of the film be a, be based, be a focusing on Michael Whitman, while the while well, the other part, while well, the minority of the film be focusing on the guy that's going. That'll be, you know, kill kill him. That's going. That's going to kill him. And as, and as, and as for the other, and as for other parts, well, let's take a look and see, and see what I mean. In this video, we're going to take a look at the historical accuracy of the 2001 movie Enemy at the Gates, starring Jude Law. Although the movie is not dated, the viewer is given a rather pretty animated map showing the Wehrmacht moving east. And the opening, I agree with them, that historical films about dreadful events should should show some respect to the source material and the people they portray. But the best said. way of showing respect is to be accurate. But he said it. Okay, there's one. Okay, there's one. During the making of it. During what he said. Exactly. Now, dur now during the film, during the making of this move, movie, there, 
I would like to have. They like to have a try to get a try to make a scene a tank scene to get that's so good it would get on this it would get on this list. Let's see what let's see what ta what tank scenes are already on this list. I watch Mojo.com. Make tracks to the armory. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our choices for the top 10 movie tank scenes. For this list, we're keeping the criteria pretty wide open. Any movie scene that features a tank prominently is eligible. As you've probably guessed, there will be a few spoilers ahead, so spoiler alert. Now, let's get tanked. Number 10, making a deal, Kelly's Heroes. All this guy is doing is God in the bank like he was told. Yeah, maybe. But I wonder if he knows what's in it. Who says enemies can't put aside their differences and cooperate, even during wartime? Here, a group of U.S. soldiers that include Donald Sutherland, Kelly Savalas, and Clint Eastwood proves that they're able to come to an agreement with a German tank commander that they encounter in Nazi-occupied France. You and us... We're just soldiers, right? We don't even know what this war is all about. With a bit of smooth talking, the soldiers convince the German to turn the firepower of his tank away from them and towards the doors of the bank that he's unwittingly defending. You know what's inside that bank, man? There's $16 million worth of gold in that bank, sweetheart. But only after promising to cut him in for a share of the gold stashed away inside. All you have to do to have an equal share of this money is crank this turret around and blow a hole in that door. Number nine, male bonding, the interview. Holy moly! Is that real? It was a gift to my grandfather from Stalin. In my country, it's pronounced Stallone. What do singer Katy Perry and a tank have in common? In this case, both hold the dubious distinction of having captured the affection of North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Liking Katy Perry and drinking margaritas is gay? Who wants to be straight? Oh, not me. <laughs> Boring! The gleefully absurd depiction of one of the most reviled heads of state in the entire world riding around in a tank and blowing things up while grooving to firework is priceless. Of course, this gift from Stalin comes in handy later when Dave and Aaron have to escape. Is this Katie Perry? Just leave it on, it's helping me concentrate. Coupled with the poetic justice eventually tied to both the song and the tank, this movie tank easily earns its place on this list. Number eight, City. Yeah, yeah. That probably, the interview was probably a bad idea, especially how, especially, especially because of how North Korea responded to that movie. So please, please note, if you're gonna make, you're gonna make a move, move please note that if you're gonna make a movie with Kim, that has Kim Jong, the leader of North Korea in it, you probably should let him in on, you should probably let him in on it with it and get his behalf, you know what I mean? Anyway, but it did, but this, but this part actually show, but this part actually shows he actually show. But I think this part scene, this scene actually shows how he, even there, even in this movie hit that he's a villain. Well, well, and through his, the North, the North Korean eyes, we're the, we're the villain, we're the bad guys, then through our eyes. And through some of our eyes, too. they're the bad guys, but that's not how I see it. We're all human. And this is a good example of how how you make it, how you make evil, even though it's evil, evil people, human. Make them as human as possible is what Steven Spielberg says. And I, and I think this scene did a good job of that. I could be wrong. 
And no offense to you, Kim Jong Un, if you're watching this. Just detailing the facts. Any, anyway, continuing on. Number eight, City Chase, Goldeneye. Everyone knows that James Bond is not someone to trifle with. And in this film, 007 also proves that he has the ability to drive literally anything during a chase. Instead of a sleek British sports car, Bond steers a clunky Russian tank through the streets of St. Petersburg in pursuit of the corrupt head of the Russian space division. You're the bumper. That's how it's for. While not quite as refined or nimble as any of his Aston Martins, the tank more than makes up for any speed or aerodynamic shortcomings with sheer durability. Number seven, Bloodshed, Stalingrad. When it comes to great tank scenes, sometimes, at least in terms of impact, more is actually more. From its use of multiple tanks, to the pristine snow that becomes increasingly stained with blood, to the scores of soldiers who perish in fire and ice, this segment from the 1993 war film Stalingrad showcases the horrors of war in a stunningly stark and ominous fashion. Looking away is almost impossible, and because of the fact that the scene is based on a real-life battle that occurred during World War II, it's also unforgettable. Number six, intoxicated driver, Buffalo Soldiers. Figure out where we're going yet, man? Uh, we're going the wrong way. Hey, Johnny, make a, a left. What's more dangerous than encountering a group of well-trained military personnel driving a tank? Running into a group of well-trained military personnel who are hopped up on smack while driving a tank, obviously. Wait. chaos and destruction that ensues during this late Cold War era yarn is both amusing and alarming. After injecting heroin, a group of military men take a tank on a joyride to places it was never meant to go. Shit, man. We just ran over a car, man. We just squashed a car. What kind of car? The Volkswagen the Beetle. Oh, no. We squashed the Beetle. The results are literally explosive. Five, Monkey Mischief, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. In all of the Planet of the Apes movies, a major component of the story is that the apes become more intelligent and begin to more closely resemble their human relatives. Apes! Do not want war! In this case, one of the apes, Koba, shows that in addition to mirroring many positive human behaviors, some of the apes have also acquired a very human propensity for negative traits, like hatred. Koba is proof that hatred can lead to war when he hijacks a tank and uses it in battle against its human creators. Number see four, hate. hanging tough. See what hatred can do? War. That's why. That's why I should never. That's why hatred, hatred, and war, and warfare should be permanently sep separated for for good. If I said that right. Number four, hanging tough. Fury. You know that a tank is something special when it's the title character in a movie, as is the case in Fury. In fact, not only does the tank have a title role, it has top billing over megastar oh. Brad Pitt. God damn it! Living up to its name, the awe-inspiring machine helps allied troops fight against the Third Reich, even battling a superior tiger tank, until it can fight no longer. 
Oh the inspiring scene is a David and Goliath story, but with tanks, so it's much, much cooler. No! Number three, Road Menace, Fast and Furious 6. Uh, guys, we gotta come up with another plan. They got a tank. I'm sorry, did somebody just say a tank? It's muscle cars versus military might as the good guys chase the bad guys on a crowded highway. Even for some of the best drivers in the world, getting the job done is a challenge. We do what we do best. We improvise, all right? The sight of a tank bearing down on the unsuspecting travelers from behind is enough to make moviegoers gasp, and the effect is even more harrowing when the chase moves to the wrong side of the road. Okay, John, take us to the other side. Let's have some fun. Tank versus cars? That hardly seems fair. Somebody better do something! I got a tank on my head! Number two, tank face down, saving Private Ryan. Oh, I'm surprised this one got number one. When you have not one, but two important goals in a battle, you can't be intimidated by the opposition's heavy artillery. Sticky bombs. Get out! Get out! In this film, Army Rangers Captain John Miller is tasked with not only fighting the Nazis at France, but also with safely bringing home the last surviving son of an American family that's received more than its fair share of bad news recently. You came all the way out here to tell me that? With so much and so many counting on him, Captain Miller unflinchingly gives it his all, in spite of the odds, as a huge tank rolls menacingly towards him. Before we reveal our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. No, they're trying to fly the tank. <laughs> Honorable mentions. No. Mine tank, the eight. They're trying to fly the tank. Big fly the tank! You can't fly the tank, Lou! Rotate 16 degrees! Tanks, and on three! Come in, and on three! Yeah, attacks from my position. Yes, sir, immediately. Immediately, sir, I understand. Number one, the rescue. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Jones is getting away! Think not, Herr Donovan. Not that Jones, the other Jones. Even a tank full of angry Nazis is no match for a man on a horse. If that man happens to be Indiana Jones, that is. A nail biter to the end, this scene sees Indy with his father's life and the fate of the entire world resting on his shoulders. You call this off the altar? With his father and the map to the Holy Grail in enemy hands, Indy must do everything possible to rescue them, including take on a tank, take on its driver, and take the serious risk of being launched off a cliff. Do you agree with our list? For more armor-plated top tens published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. You think a scene like you think I do you think a scene from the this movie this movie I did could actually beat all could actually top this could actually get into get into this list? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below. But before, before I end this video I'm gonna do I'm gonna show you What do you think? Okay.
First off, let me show you this. What do you think? Kind of a good, kind of a good poster boy. Almost similar to the Enemy at the Gates. One's with, one's Whitman, the other's Ekans. But I think these two need to switch places. Since one, or some, that since one, one will maybe in the center a tank or something. I don't, I don't know. But you give me your thoughts about that. What if you think this kind of a, this kind of a poster would be good? Good for a good for a movie like this. I can even leave a link to you down in the description description below. But all, but I'm not done yet just yet. So hang on. So you please stand. So hang on. Okay. First off, first off, the first off, I wanted to show you show you something I noticed in one of the a comment from one of these YouTube videos that I'm not showing you from this from this movie. Titanic guy, Titanic guy for a complete scene. That's all I'm gonna show you. Skip navigation. One. Random Arsh Games. Thirteen subscribers. Subscribe. Home. Videos. Playlists. Up. I'm glad I brought everyone some nostalgia. Uh, here we go. Here we go. The fact that we all know the outcome, even before seeing this movie, the scene makes you think that maybe they'll still miss it. That's movie magic right there. And that's a good idea. Ten, I think that's a ten, tense moment. Create that tense moment there. Same thing with this one. S0 Undwaf 3 2025 two months ago. The intensity of this scene. Every time I see how hard everyone is working to turn the damn ship, I pray that they make it this time. 73. Likes. Reply. Hide reply. SG underscore 111 three days ago. 423 keep on turning. You'll make it. Smiley face. And even here. Here too. Every time I watch this, I still think they're gonna just barely dodge it. Tense mode, like it's a, like you think you know it's gonna happen, but you make, like you know it's gonna happen, but you know you know in your heart it's gonna happen, but you want the uh, make them think that it's not going to happen. Like James Cameron did with Titanic and the iceberg scene.
to even hear. Most incredible scene in this movie, the way the mood and intensity changes almost in an instant. See if I get it all. Okay, I think that's it. Alright. See how much the comment section here is.
Okay. Guess that's it. See what comments I can squeeze out of this video. Not long. Skip navigation. One. Zero oh seven slash forty six colon fifty five. Jake Lang two months ago. I operate a bulldozer for a living, and the sound of the tracks day after day will drive you nuts I can't imagine what these guys went through. 3. Reply. Sturman Fantrist, 2 months ago. Highest scoring tank case, is a lie, Kurt Nispel was the highest ace. 113. Reply. Hide 24 replies. Rubblefin, 2 months ago. It took less than 30 seconds for the writers to get something wrong. 7. Reply. Tony Romano two months ago. Wasn't Kurt actually artillery? 1. Reply. Rubblefin two months ago. At Tony Romano, I'm fairly certain that Nispel was just a tanker. Whitman, however, started in armored cars and did some time in assault guns i think my memory might be failing me though five reply michael sexton two months ago a quick wikipedia check notes that the numbers for both kurt nispel and michael whitman are in question three reply placid dragon two months ago at Michael Sexton they are always going to be, same, as the air aces having their numbers questioned, etc. 1. Reply. Gabriel Velasquez, 2 months ago. Michael Sexton well yeah, there wasn't a referee on the battlefield keeping official count. 4. Reply. Michael Sexton, 2 months ago. At Gabriel Velasquez the point was that claiming either or is conjecture because the counts are unverified. Reply. Michael Sexton, two months ago. At Placid Dragon I agree, but my point was to the argument that one was better when for both the numbers are unverified. 1. Reply. ACH two months ago. Indeed. Nispel scored the highest, but he wasn't liked by the leadership, because A, he wasn't Waffen SS and B, he wasn't a poster boy for the party, cause etc. Nispel was unruly, did as he liked, but could because of his feats, etc. However the best of all is still Carius, Imo, as he's the one that survived, and had more kills than Whitman, I think. Granted, luck also plays into that, where are you deployed etc. But yeah, Whitman had real skill. After all his first skills were done against multiple T-34 when he was alone in an early version Stu G with the Stummel Cannon, short barreled, slow velocity 75mm, that's nothing to be sneered at. Read more. 7. Reply. Linden Tree, two months ago. This is was a television production, not a fact show. Indeed. Nispel scored the highest, but he wasn't liked by the leadership, because A, he wasn't Waffen SS and B, he wasn't a poster boy for the party, cause etc. Nispel was unruly, did as he liked, but could because of his feats, etc. However the best of all is still Carius, Imo, as he's the one that survived, and had more kills than Whitman, I think. Granted, luck also plays into that, where are you deployed etc. But yeah, Whitman had real skill, after all his first skills were done against multiple T-34 when he was alone in an early version Stu G with the Stummel Cannon, short barrel, slow velocity 75mm, that's nothing to be sneered at. 7. Reply. Linden Tree, 2 months ago. 
This is was a television production, not a fact show. 1. Reply. Linden Tree, two months ago. At Michael Sexton, Wiki is a bastion of truth, lol. 2. Reply. Jester Flight, two months ago. John Holmes was also a legend that left behind an immense amount of carnage in his wake. 2. Reply. Michael Sexton, two months ago. At Linden Tree. Skip. Oh well. Well, well. well, you get the idea. I don't know if the I don't know the facts are based or not. But you still, but you still get it. I think this would be a great. I think this would be a great movie. I think. Still. Still. It's still a matter of getting, trying to get it get it factually correct. Anyway, thank. Cause I, if you wanted to, you wanted to get the. Uh, oh yeah, today's August eighth and tomorrow's August 9th, which means, which means, tomorrow's Shark Week. And guess who's with me right now? Hi everybody, it's me, Bruce the Shark. <laughs> oh, sometimes, sometimes I crack myself up when I do that. Anyway. Anyway. I mean, Bruce here has been with me in the tank, in the tank for a while, for a while now. Isn't that right? Isn't that right, Bruce? Yep, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Say hi. Say hi, Bruce, everybody. Hi, audience. Don't forget to watch Shark Week. Anyway, I think it's time. I think it's time to end this. I think it's time to end this video. So, thank. So thanks for watching this video. And don't forget to like, comment, comment, subscribe, subscribe, and leave a comment down below if you can. Help this channel grow. Grow by subscribing. By now, by now, subscribing to this channel, but also sharing this channel with as many people as you can. Friends, family, complete strangers, the possibilities are endless. So, so they can subscribe too, and then do, do the same thing over, do the same thing over, over and over again. Over and over again. Also, also, I would, I would pretty much appreciate if you could share. If you could share this video, I would very much appreciate. If you could share this video with as many people as you can, friends, family, complete strangers, the possibilities are endless. I would, I would also very much appreciate, appreciate it. Help this video reach a hundred plus view views or even a thousand because if you like the if you're liking my idea because if you're liking my if you're liking my ideas that I'm sharing on YouTube so far keep keep liking and subscribing so that way I'll, that way I'll know more no know to do more of these videos But until, but for the time, but for the time being, I'm going to be taking a break from uploading videos onto YouTube. The next time, 
until Shark Week is over. The next time you'll see see me on YouTube will be will be during the D the DNC, the Democratic National Convention. I'll be doing live videos again. So be ready for that. So be ready for that. Cause I will be. I got other other kinds of ideas, but I need, but I still need help in coming. But I still need help. But I still need help at them um, coming up at date dates on which dates on which to come. You know. dates on which to you know, you know air them because I'm only doing certain doing them on certain dates also There might have been more, there might be more, but I might. There might be more, but I'll probably only say it, say it in the script. I would say it, but I don't know if I can. No. Just like wish I wish I could make a better back, better background. Next time, it's your part. Don't. Oh wait, hold on. Oh, again, getting reports of an enemy tank. Sit, sit back, folks, because you're gonna. Sit back, folks, because you're gonna see me. You're gonna see me in that. You're gonna watch me take out an enemy tank. That's how you take out an enemy tank. Oh yeah, baby. Until next time, this is Jeff Jeff Bertel signing up. Signing up. Wait. What's that? Holy. Shit.